All right, all right, all right. Welcome to Myth Vision. We figured it out. We had serious technical difficulties, really software stuff. As much as I do live streams, I'm also a dinosaur, so there's some things I could have helped. Dr. Del B. Martin, welcome to Myth Vision. Hello. Thank you for joining me. I, I got to give you an introduction here. You've never been on Myth Vision yet. But uh, Dr. Martin uh, is an American New Testament scholar and historian of Christianity. Uh, Martin joined the faculty of Yale University in 1999 and retired at, as the Wolseley. Am I pronouncing that properly? Wolseley. Wolseley. Professor of Religious Studies in 2018 before Yale. He was a faculty member at Rhodes College and Duke University, which was down the road from where I used to live in North Carolina. Um, Martin has degrees from Abilene Christian University, Princeton Theological Seminary, and Yale. He was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2009. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about yourself as we enter in this discussion? Uh, you might just mention that I'm in happy retirement in Galveston, so I'm no longer anywhere near Yale. Okay. You are retired and officially enjoying, trying to enjoy, I suspect, uh, your life. You have published quite a bit of work here. Today, we're going to be discussing Sex and the Single Savior. That is the book uh, or book topic for today. It's actually a bunch of articles, I think, that you've published and found a way to put into a book. And I uh, was going over that. And, and I'm curious to get people to check this book out themselves because our modern understanding of things don't always match the ancient understanding of things. Uh, so we're going to get into some of this stuff, I suspect, over time. But I'd love to cover one that really catches my attention is slavery as salvation. Mm -hmm. I just did an episode yesterday um, literally talking to Dr. Jennifer Glancy about slavery. And that one was really a fantastic recording. So anything you'd like to say about your books? Uh, no. Um, slavery as Salvation was my a version of my dissertation. It was my first book, and it was the dissertation I submitted to Wayne Meeks, who was my advisor at Yale. And then uh, Yale University Press published it not long after that. Um, and so each of the books that I've published has been something of a follow-up of a, of a book or a study before. Um, so you're right, Sex and the Single Savior was originally just a bunch of essays. There were six articles and essays that I had published before in either um, journals or in chapters in books, mostly chapters in other people's books. Got it. And then I just collected those and put them into one book, wrote an introduction and a conclusion. Although I did, I think I added about to the six essays that, that were already existing, I added five more essays that I wrote at that time. So uh, as you can, I think, see that was published in what, 1906 or something. I mean, 2006. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite old enough for 1906. Right, right. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, that was... Um, that was because uh, I've said offhand things here and there throughout all of my writings about gender, sexuality, uh, and, and, and sex. And, you know, people would keep asking me, well, what is your book about this? Mm. You know, do you have all this stuff in one place? And I never did. So I put those things in that uh, book and published it in 2006. And it still gets a lot of attention yeah, it caught my attention, and I thought to myself, okay, um, I'd love to discuss this with you to find out more. Something that just a little bit about me, my audience knows this, but I emphasize it because someone new might be watching that's never seen me or you. Um, I grew up in a house very conservative, very uh, you know old school. My dad was a retired Green Beret in the Special Forces. I was a fundamentalist Christian who had a certain idea of the world around him. I judged, if you will, because I thought my understanding was the proper understanding of all things. And now that I've come out of this fundamentalism, I've started recognizing more nuance to the world and understanding not everybody's born in a house with the same kind of upbringing and structure that I may have had. And um, so the topic of sex, gender, the sensitivity from people who come from feminist studies, different things really catch my attention because it's like visiting another planet, but it's been right under my nose the whole time. I've never noticed it. So another thing just to plug, 
as we continue, your books are here. There is a recent video that uh, I actually edited this because I work with Bart Ehrman that he did. Does the Bible condemn homosexuality? Guest interview by Jeffrey Syker. And of course, it's complicated. It's a complicated thing because it's not the same as we imagine today. And I hope to get into that. I have a Patreon for those who want to support us. And we have a course site for scholars. If you're interested in taking courses with MPP courses, just launched another one. We've got four courses out now and we're still building more. Okay. Dr. Martin, why'd you write this book? Or why did you compile it and decide to make this into a book? Because I kept getting a lot of questions about it from people, um, you know, and I realized that I got tired of saying, well, if you looked at my book, so-and-so and so-and-so, you know, you might see that I addressed that question there or this article or that article, which were most of the articles were not really accessible to your normal person. They had to go to a library and, you know, search down the, the article and, you know, read it there in the library or try to get it online or something like that. So um, I think, in fact, that was, you said that was the person interviewing Bart was Jeff Sykes. Yes. Uh, Syker. Syker. That's right. Yes, sir. Well, Jeff and, and I and Bart were all three friends way back at Princeton uh, when we were getting our master's degree. So it's been a long time before now. But we were friends. We've been friends for our whole careers. And um, uh, even I, you know, one or two of the articles uh, were actually written at the request of Jeff Sykes, Syker. Um, and he published a book mainly for a Presbyterian and church audience that included uh, articles and essays by a bunch of different people. Uh, some of them were supportive of gay people and some of them were not. Right. Um, and so uh, that's where that article first came out was Jeff Syker was the editor of it and published it. So it was easy to kind of, you know, work with him to pull together the other essays and just put them all in one place. There's a couple. So as the, the interview proceeds and continues, of course, I want everybody in the chat to know, thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting us. Uh, the likes, the shares, the comments, showing love to Dr. Martin for his time, giving your attention to us here and being patient for the stream to start. I'll get your super chats here in just a bit, which you can super chat questions, comments. All I ask is that you're respectful. Um, Dr. Martin, I want to ease our way into this subject because it is obviously um, a sensitive one for many people, but also it's it's something I think that a lot of people can use to really stop weaponizing, as we say, the Bible. So the first thing that comes to mind is Jesus is single, at least portrayed single. Uh, forget what Dan Brown says. Uh, it seems like he's a single man. What what have your what is your studies on this? Is it odd to find that you have a Jewish rabbi like Jesus who's single? What, what is have you as a personal like researcher into this and studying this historically and such? Has that like raised your eyebrows? No, but it's because I know more a lot. I know a lot more about ancient Judaism than most people do. Um, a lot of people when they say that they're taking modern traditional ideas of Judaism. Um, what we call Judaism today really came about more from the rabbis than it did from Jesus directly or from any of the prophets. Up until uh, the year 200 or so, or sometime in the second century of our century, uh, Judaism was not that different from the other countries around it. And so they had prophets, but other countries had prophets. Uh, some of their prophets were single and some of them taught against marriage and child rearing. Uh, it was not unusual in the ancient world. Uh, you have Greeks and Romans who did it. You have Jews who did it. You have Christians who did it. What changed was, uh, for some reason, the rabbis, and starting around the year maybe 150 or 200, they started teaching that uh, good Jews should be married and have children. They should procreate. Now, there's been a lot of debate about, or a lot of just assumptions about why this happened. Some people just said, well, Judaism has always been much more pro-family than non-Jewish cultures. Well, that's just not true. And all you have to do is read a ton of ancient Jewish pre-70, pre-200 texts, and they're not necessarily pro-family or 
procreation. They're kind of like whatever's around them. Um, and so, but what happens is I think that, and this is just my theory, and this may be controversial. I think the rabbis changed their view precisely because Christian uh, monasticism was becoming so powerfully important. It was attracting so many people. Uh, you know, the monastic movement really starts off kind of in the second century. So we're talking around the year 150 or something like that. But it doesn't really get going strong until after the year 400. But around, uh, around 200, the rabbis, I think, start noticing this. And so that's when you have the first kind of gatherings of rabbinic scholars. And they start interpreting the Jewish Bible uh, to uh, promote sex in the family, mm -hmm. or procreation in the family. But actually, people will point out that they, act, they promoted even sex. They basically taught that, uh, you know, every man and his wife should have sex every Friday evening. Uh, after the wife goes to the bath, of course, uh, she goes to the Jewish bath and then she comes home and then they have sex. And this is kind of what the rabbis sort of promoted. But that didn't start happening until 150 years after Jesus' death. So if you want to understand what Jesus was talking about, you have to look at the Judaism of the year 50, not 150 or 200. And if you do that, you see, and, and I point a lot of this out in my books in several different places, that um, there's a reason that modern scholars and Christians kind of invented the myth of the pro-sex rabbis in Judaism of the ancient world. And then they transferred that to Jesus. But it's just not the case if you look at the historical sources. Things shifted in the second century is what I'm saying. And then uh, the, the rabbis started promoting sex and procreation and the Christians started to become even more anti-sex and anti-procreation after the year 200. So Dr. Martin, if there's any way I could get you to tilt your, your screen just to get you more into the picture, um, I might do this here. I don't know if to I try could. and center us a little bit here. Um, my my iPad's on a stand, so is this okay, or is this that's fine with me? If that's fine with you, I'm good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I just wanted to make sure we got more of you in the shot. Um, so, okay, sex and the single savior. Uh, all these issues with sex, a lot of them come up when it comes to same sex relations. A lot of people, especially when I was growing up. We would use the Bible and the one sin among the whole list that Paul might list or whatnot, the one sin that was really the big no-no, right? It's almost like you favor the one was that a man with a man or a woman with a woman. And so I wanted to dive into this because your book actually deals with these terms. So can you edge us into this whole topic and what you have discovered that is different from what we see today or how how are you addressing this thing that Paul list? And does Jesus agree with this? Like, where does Jesus fall into this category? Because as you well, I mean, I've seen lectures by you, you've read some of your works, and you're you're not a person who thinks everything we see in the gospels is what Jesus actually said. It's it, you're very critical. Um, so how do we understand what Jesus thought and what is Paul doing here? Well, if you really want to get into the problems of what did Jesus do and think, you have to really dig down deep into the scholarship called the historical Jesus scholarship, which uses a bunch of different methods for trying to figure out what sources can we use to get material about Jesus of Nazareth? What um, methods do we use to winnow out the historical from the ahistorical? Um, how do we decide then uh, what we want to, go back and attribute to the historical Jesus and to people who wrote after him. Um, that's all very complicated. I mean, people spend their whole careers. And in fact, I have written on the historical Jesus in several different contexts, showing how I would do it. One of the chapters in the Sex and the Single Savior kind of goes through and talks about the different visions of this sort of thing uh, in the Bible and early Christianity. And I have a section of that on, okay, what would we say if we were just doing the historical Jesus? And I come out with some conclusions. Um, and, but that's, it's all very complicated. So 
uh, but the person has to ask, okay, the other thing is I'm something of an amateur theologian also in Christianity. And I need to constantly point out that the source for Christian doctrine and Christian faith is not the historical Jesus. It's the Jesus of the Bible. Right. And so uh, you can spend all your life hunting for the historical Jesus. But if that's what you're basing your faith on, then you're not being very orthodox from a Christian point of view. Right. Um, so uh, I think that what's important to see, though, is that once you pull back the scope from the historical Jesus to early Christianity and its teachings, then you find a wide variety of views. You do find anti-family views and you find pro-family views um, among both Jews and Christians. And so, um, but Christianity became, um, I think Christianity became more and more ascetic, uh, that is controlling of both food and diet and sex and desire. Um, I think it became more ascetic as time went on. And partly because they looked around, I think, and they said, hey, this works. You know, there are a lot of ordinary people out there who are attracted to this ascetic movement. And I've tried to explain that in various ways, that in the ancient world, sex was linked with procreation and procreation was linked with death. So if you want to escape the cycle of death in human experience, then one of the best ways to cut the cord is to stop having sex. Right. So um, <laughs> that makes sense. And it, so that's the way people reasoned in the ancient world. And so it became uh, the avoidance of sex became very popular uh, in both Christian and non-Christian movements. And, and it just happened in, in a period of time from the year, from the year, say, 200 until, well, all the way through until the Reformation. You really had to have Martin Luther and John Calvin come along before you had the uh, Protestant redemption of sexuality that you got uh, in the Reformation and modernity. So it was a movement that swept through the ancient world and the medieval world. And it's complicated and it takes a lot of historical explanation, but that's the short answer. Yeah, there's, and I asked a historical Jesus one, which I don't blame you for taking the time to actually try to spell that out because it's difficult. Um, there's strange stuff, uh, the eunuch, right? Uh, if you can, they, there's the encouragement of being a eunuch. From what I understand, eunuchs are in a different category than just male, female. Um, they they kind of are their own little category. Am I right in uh, in this assumption and what why is he encouraging that is this really the voice of the author and what the kind of christianity of the time is trying to portray you think uh well that's all really hard to say right uh, so first question who are what are eunuchs in the ancient world the eunuchs become symbolic for a lot of different things in the ancient world they become a symbol for the avoidance of sex entirely. Although we know that they didn't avoid sex. You know, people think, oh, eunuchs could have had sex. Yeah, they could, and they did. Um, there are lots of different ways of making a man into a eunuch. And the different procedures that you use would have to do with whether he could still have an erection, whether he could still ejaculate, and whether he was still fertile enough to procreate. Now, most of the time he wasn't fertile enough because they usually tried to make sure he couldn't have children. And that's because the reason they used eunuchs was not to preserve the purity of the eunuch. It's because they used eunuchs to take care of their women, their wives and daughters. Mm -hmm. And so they want, and they, and, and, you know, people usually knew that there were stories all over the place about eunuchs having wild sex with women in harems and palaces and things. And they probably could have because there were there are lots of different ways to have sex. You know, you don't have to have it the old fashioned way. Um, you know, you can use all kinds of different body parts. And uh, so, and they did. Um, so, but the, the real push for it was that, you know, even if you have a eunuch in your wife's bedroom, 
who is kind of noodling her uh, or, you know, getting nasty with her. Uh, the thing you're mainly concerned about is that you don't want any children to come out of this because then you could not legally figure out whether they were your children or not. Right. So it's all, it's a, once again, a procreation thing. And we get that weird thing in one of the, the pastorals. I say weird because you could see there's a reaction, I think. Uh, it's later. I think this is a later pastoral. I can't remember if it's the name of Peter or not, but it talks about women getting salvation like by becoming baby-making machines. Like, yeah, First Timothy. Okay, it's Timothy. Got it, First Timothy. Yeah, that, that one always struck me as like odd. Like somebody's really upset here. <laughs> Yeah, if, in fact, it literally says they will be saved through childbirth. Yeah, someone's someone's on a protest, uh, <laughs> not digging what's going on. So eunuchs uh, play a special role. I, I, I wanted to bring that up because we're dealing with sex. We're dealing with the single savior, uh, Jesus, and, and how it's portrayed within our gospel narratives. And it also, in light of current events, like the many Christians who are so reluctant to people playing some category outside of the typical male or female role. It's like, hey, uh, your own savior, according to the gospels that you believe is him speaking, is encouraging this. So you might want to take some notes and understand your understanding is probably mistaken on understanding the ancient world. I just wanted to bring that up as we're edging into this. So yeah, I do. I do think that the eunuch saying probably does go back to the historical Jesus. That's a big debate. Did, did Jesus himself really make any such statement about eunuchs? Um, I think he probably did uh, just because uh, even though, because we find it in, in more than one place, it, it tends to come up. And because uh, even among some original Christian writers who wrote it back, who passed on that saying, they didn't necessarily agree with it. So one of the, the rules about when you when you find a saying that says it comes from Jesus, then you have to say, well, um, one of the ways to argue that it does come from Jesus is that it doesn't, um, let's say it doesn't pass the sniff test for whether it links up with the true beliefs of the author. Mm -hmm. And when it doesn't, then you say, well, maybe he found it in a tradition and decided to include it anyway, even though he didn't fully agree with it. That usually, it's almost like a dissimilarity argument or argument of embarrassment. It doesn't prove it goes back to Jesus, but it, it raises the, the probability that this could have gone all the way back, correct? Yes. In fact, I didn't use the terms uh, dissimilarity or embarrassment, but those are that's exactly what I was talking about. Got it. Usually goes under that kind of uh, label. It's an, it's an argument that usually goes under that label. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. I have, so I've got a comment here, and this is actually from um, Richard Carrier's blog pertaining to the topic of the two Greek words, uh, melakoi, and then I mess up the other one pretty badly, is uh, it's uh, arsenanoiki, uh, Arsenoiki or something like this. Yeah. And how do you pronounce it? The longer word is arsenokoites. Honest arsenokoites. Okay. And the short word is malakos. Got it. Well, he says, and I'm just going to read what he says and then get your thoughts because he obviously is not a believer. Um, you have fundamentalists who obviously weaponize this. And there are some who approach this who have disagreements no matter where you are on the spectrum. But I wanted to approach Paul here. And so he says the liberal critic is correct that the other type of person Paul puts on the on his list of the damned, the unmanly, sometimes translated effeminate as if meaning gay, for example, in Greek, the malakoi, I'm butchering these pronunciations, did not refer to gay men, but soft, cowardly, morally weak people of any gender, i.e. not the effeminate, but the, uh, the profligate. So this had no particular connotation against gay men, nor should we expect it to. Paul already listed gay men, so he would not list them twice, but, but list gay men as damned he did. And in the most literal way, one could manage in Greek using the word arsenonoiki, or however you pronounce this particular Greek word, a compound word um, which to bed, which has a different root meaning, but, but the same valence as the Latin coitus, 
literally meaning betters of men. Hence, this word refers to any man who has who has sexual intercourse with another man. It's pretty clear what Paul means by this. Gays are damned. This is what Paul means, according to him. I'm sure you've heard this a thousand times, especially in this research. What are your what's your take on this as you've investigated the topic? Well, the people who make those kinds of arguments don't know anything about linguistics. They don't understand language. They don't understand how language works. And I just would press them and say, okay, I say I understand the Constitution. Well, does that mean I'm standing under the Constitution? If I take the word understand apart into its two different components and define each of the components individually and then just slap the word back together and expect that word to mean the combination of these two components, that's just not the way language works. I mean, you can come up with thousands of examples. You know, so Just to emphasize for our audience, betters of men, for example, if you just took this word, you're saying the meaning of the word itself isn't just straight up what you're reading, understanding the, well, I'm not standing under the constitution, um, but that what does the word mean? In your research, okay. you have to that people have to realize this is something I've spent half my career trying to lecture on. When writers of dictionaries define write definitions for words, how do they do it? Just use empiricism, just walk around behind people who bid the editor for Webster's dictionary and see how do they make their decisions? Where do they go for their research? How do they decide what things mean? They never, ever, ever, ever take a word, take it apart into its, a multisyllabic word, and take it apart into its different components, define each of those different components literally, right, and then shove it all back together and say it's some kind of combination of those. That's just not how they, they work. That's not how the way language works. Now, I use the word understand as one example because everybody knows that it doesn't mean to stand under. Now, you might kind of come up with some creative way to say, well, maybe understand originally did mean to stand under yeah to place yourself under the meaning of this word well that's fine if you want to make that your imagination but there's no evidence for it um scholars want to have evidence right we don't want to have your stupid speculations but that's what almost all these speculations about arsenokoites meaning arseno male Coites meaning bed. Now look, even there, they make a lot of advances without any proof. They had termed that arsenos refer to any male, no matter what age or situation. And they refer that they infer that coites doesn't necessarily mean bed. It metaphorically they mean sex. Because I can sleep in a bed with a man all the time and not have sex with him. Right. It's Abraham, like, it's almost Abraham, like the an Adam knew Eve. Well, he knew her. We know what that means, but yeah. Right. Okay. So you don't, the way you figure out what a word means is you look at all the different contexts for that word you can find in a certain social context. Now the problem is arsenokoites occurs only about five or six times in the ancient world. It's very rare. And it's almost all in Christian texts. Hmm. And almost all of them, in fact, all of them post date Paul. That's the hard part. <laughs> so, you know, you can't go, you can't look at Paul and say, okay, well, let's go look for a dictionary from before Paul's time and say, okay, how did they define arsenokoites? Well, it doesn't exist. And so people will just say, oh, well, we'll just make it up. We'll just say that, you know, Paul must have meant men who have sex with men because arsenal is men male and coites is bad but it can also mean sex well what is it well well why don't you just be literal about it and say men who sleep on beds that makes just as much sense as what you're saying but that's not what you want it to mean so you don't you don't say that's not what it means so people who use this kind of definitional applicability number one they don't understand language they they're not linguists Number two, they don't understand how language usually works. 
Number three, they don't understand how, de how dictionaries usually make definitions of words and thus how scholars should make definitions of words. And so they just throw all of that out the window and say, well, I happen to know that it means men who have sex with men. Well, you have to know that because it backs up your bigotry, frankly. So, uh, sorry, just to jab in here. This is, this is, uh, so I, I'm, I'm fairly confident that Richard Carrier is not anti-gay, just so you know. He's, I think he's, I think there's a lot of scholars who out here do this, but I, I do want to make a point that you're not saying that it isn't implying that there's some sexual act taking place with the context of the rest of the sins being listed, but but you're saying it doesn't mean just man laying with another man. It's it, There's more to the context in trying to understand the meaning of this term, correct? In fact, it can mean the same way as I've argued that malakos doesn't refer to homosexuality. It can refer to any kind of sex along with all kinds of other things like wearing perfume or having your hair done at the beauty shop or you know, wearing fancy clothes. Malakos means all those things. So to separate it out into one kind of sexual meaning is just, it's just bad scholarship. In fact, that's no scholarship. Um, but that's, and I, I'm not saying that everybody who puts forth these opinions are anti-gay right. or homophobic, because they're not. Right. Sometimes they're just not very good scholars. They just believe what they've read in books or they believe what some professor told them in school. And they haven't gone back and done the original research, you know, so, you know, that's what I did. I took every time I could find, and I used computer searches, every time I could find the word arsenocortes or something similar like arsenocortea, which is kind of the noun abstract from arsen arsenocortes. Ars arsenocortes refers to a person. Right. Arsenocortea refers to the state um, of being, of being in arsenocortea. Now, but there are just as many ways that you, you could see that as saying, these are men who like sex with women too much. In fact, that's one of the main meanings of malakos, is it's when men who are soft, that's the literal meaning of malakos is soft. But, you know, soft can mean, almost, can mean almost anything. And it did mean almost anything in the ancient world. We have, but, you know, I took, I, f I tried to find the few different words, occurrences of arsenicoites, or arsenicoitea, or whatever, in ancient Greek, both before and right after Paul. Mm. Now, there's nothing before Paul with the actual word. Now, some scholars will do, again, this kind of commonsensical way of, they think they're doing good scholarship, because they say, well, in Leviticus, there's a Leviticus passage that says, that has the word arson and the word coites in the same paragraph. Well, then they just say, okay, just put them together. And a lot of them say Paul was the first one who ever put them together. He was the originator of this term. Well, they don't know that. This is just ridiculous. I wish scholars would, you know, these people who say this would pay more attention to a scholarship actually functions. It just doesn't work that way. And it doesn't work that way in any discipline. I don't care whether you're talking about Shakespeare's use of language or Paul's use of language. They just don't use language that way. So I actually took every time I could find arsenicoites or any of those borrowed words in any time around the time of Paul or before the time of Paul or in the first few hundred years after Paul. Now, the fact is it occurs very, very seldom. It occurs nowhere that we can find before Paul. Uh, unless you try to say, well, we're going to combine arson from these texts with coites from these texts. Right, right, right. Now, uh, just, just so we're on the same page, what do you make, because your work specifically dwells on the first century with Paul here, but the Leviticus passage, how do you understand that passage? Do you think there is a condemnation there? And I know the interview that I was mentioning with with uh, uh, Jeffrey Syker and and. Uh, Bart Ehrman does the Bible condemn homosexuality. They go to this passage and he brings up an interesting point, whether these are two men that they're condemning together um, or not. He's like, look, uh, you mixing fabrics. I mean, literally you're just as condemned as if this was somehow eating the wrong foods or this behavior. If they're thinking these are two men, what do you interpret that Leviticus passage to maybe mean two men together? Well, number one, 
I think uh, a lot of people are influenced by the Greek translation of the passage. Ah. And in the Greek translation, it does make it a, look a little bit more like men with men. But if you just take the Hebrew in its original context, uh, it could mean all sorts of things. Um, literally, it, it says, males who have male, males who lie with males as a male lies with females are condemned. Well, what does that mean? In the modern world, since we're so, you know, obsessed with, obsessed with homosexuality, <laughs> we can't seem to get that. But, but people have pointed out, this could just mean uh, if you have sex with a woman, you know, if you have sex with a man, but you do it in the same positions that you would use with a woman, that's doing it as with a woman, then you're condemned. But if you have, you know, some other kind of sex, then, you know, it's not a man having sex with a woman as with a woman. It's just right. a man having sex with a man. So you could say that in the original Hebrew, and that's, that's one verse, there's another verse in, I think, Deuteronomy that basically repeats this, right. um, but the words are the same. There's just, see, this is the problem with interpretation. People who aren't used to this don't understand. You can't pin down interpretation to one meaning. It just never works that way. It, this, so the Hebrew version of that verse in Leviticus it could be almost anything. It could be a man who has um, a man who has sex with another man by kissing him. Because, you know, who kisses another man? You don't kiss other men, you kiss women. You fuck another man. So that's what they'll say. You know, you could say that just as easily, but nobody takes that route because it doesn't support the anti-homosexual reading of the passage. Right. So, so there, it's that de there is definite propaganda. And, and for me, like whatever the Bible says on for me, like it, it doesn't harm me one way or the other, at least anymore. But that's because I've kind of let go of, of that kind of radical fundamentalist. There was a, pro there's propaganda built into this and notice we always focus on that one part of the whole section that Paul's condemning. And like, it, we're overly obsessed with that's the sin that'll make you a reprobate or, you know, the, the, there's all sorts of apologetics that are out there doing this. So uh, I'm sure you're aware of Eden Dershowitz work. He actually does some really interesting things to say that he thinks maybe even some scribes have inserted stuff within what we see in the Hebrew Bible, because initially it was incestual material rather than it being uh, maybe same sex relations as some have interpreted this to mean. Uh, do you have a thought, any thoughts on this or? Well, I definitely agree that um, scribes all over the through history have both deleted and inserted things into scripture. That's just what they did. So that's always one of the part of scholarship is, okay, do you take the time to go back and try to figure out, okay, what's the original author say about this? And what did he think he meant? Well, even then, we're getting so far back in history that we don't even know who the original author was. Right. And there's no way to find out. So I basically say, the only thing that's responsible scholarship is for you to look at the function of this terminology in its different historical context, and then say, okay, now what can we say it meant over a period of time and a string of different social and environmental uh, contexts? And certainly, uh, you could have had somebody, both in the ancient world and later, who said, oh, this refers to men, uh, it refers to those monks over there who sleep together. You know, they shouldn't be doing that. But but there's just lots of other ways to interpret it. And yeah. that's why the history of the meaning of the Bible really can never be done without the history of interpretation. Now, my main goal has been, uh, as you may well understand from your background, I, I don't want to quibble over every little word in the Bible because I don't think we'll ever get to an answer about all that stuff. Right. What I want to get, get people to do, and this is what my Sex and the Single Savior tried to do this with its first and last chapters. And then my book, um, uh, Pedagogy the Bible, 
tried to show how this could be done also throughout the Bible. And in my book, um, Biblical Truths, tried to show how this could be done in a theologically sophisticated sense. And I've tried to teach in all those books that the meaning of the text is not decided by some historical critic who gets back to the ancient meaning. It's decided by the modern person who uses it for whatever purpose they're going to use it for. And so I say, if you're a Christian, you need to first start off with your Christianity and not assume that you're going to inform all of your Christianity by some kind of historical reading of the Bible. That's not how it works. Um, your historical reading of the Bible is usually influenced by your form of Christianity rather than vice versa. Right, right, right. So the perception, the glasses we wear help us determine what we're seeing as the meaning. And, and, and like the, answer to that, the answer to that is not to do what modern people think the answer is. A lot of modern Christians also, which is just take off your glasses. Right. No. We're all bringing something to the table. Yeah. In, in while uh, you and me have talked about this a long time ago, I want to try to understand the historical context surrounding things the best we can. And I get there are no matter what, we can't get into the mind of these people, but we can try to understand the meaning. That's why I want to ask you as a scholar, since we've kind of touched on Leviticus, we know that there's these these passages that people love going to. Ignore the rest of them, but focus on these because these are so potent to our agenda, politically, ethically, socially, whatever it may be. How do you understand, like, what is your personal walk away? If you were doing all your historical research, I know that you're, you have your own subjective, uh, everyone does, uh, in how we're looking at this, but when you walk away from reading Paul, cultural context, Corinthian church, what's going on in Corinth, how do you understand what Paul's saying here to this audience the best you can? What do you think he means by this? Even though we don't know with absolute certainty, what what do you think he means? Well, in First Corinthians, Paul, which is where most of it comes up, uh, Paul is addressing different questions that the Corinthian church had posed to him, and the Corinthian church was divided, heavily divided, in at least into at least two uh, sections, um, and one of them seems to have been more ascetic than the other, and so. Uh, you know, there, First Corinthians is organized into different chapters. You know, the first part of it deals with simply the theme of unity, because Paul's and there, there, that's where he comes up with all the body images, the body metaphor. You know, the church is like the body. The body of Christ is the body of the church, and and the body is not meant to be split. And uh, but there he introduces something that's rather unusual in the ancient world. He says that the higher members of the body, like the head must submit to the lower members of the body, such as the feet or the genitals. And it's that flipping of the status hierarchy of the body that makes Paul's teaching about the body so unusual in 1 Corinthians. But that's the main theme of the whole letter. Mm -hmm. And then he starts hitting up, once he's established that that's what's really going on, is that the church is the body of Christ and it must be functioning in a loving manner. So he introduces the theme of love very quickly also. And love doesn't mean feelings. It means looking out for the betterment of your fellow human being. But then, you know, he gets into, you know, go, taking other Christians to law courts. He says, you know, you sh should stop doing this. And there he again faces the issues of social status, because it's pretty clear that the people who would be suing their Christian brothers and sisters would be the higher status members because they would be better able to get good representation in Roman courts. Lower status people could get very little good representation in Roman courts or Greek courts for that matter. So Paul is sat, he's siding with the lower status members in the church at Corinth. Uh, and then you get um, chapter seven, which is this chapter on marriage and sex and there again paul admits that maybe the people who want to avoid sex even in marriage maybe they do have the better argument but he says they should submit to the weakness of their brothers and sisters and and that means if if you're a man who's married to a woman and she wants to have sex then you have sex with her and it doesn't matter whether you want to show that you're superior so he takes um, go through the list. Mm -hmm.
uh, women, pr women praying in tongues oh. in First uh, Corinthians 11. And so he says, you know, let you know they should veil themselves. Well, that's kind of unusual because Paul usually argues that women should be com treated completely equally, at least in the church. But there he wants to say that women should veil themselves, and he says a very strange term. He says because of the angels. Yeah, and, they want to have sex with them, right? Uh, well, that's that's the debate. You know, there's yeah. been a million interpretations about those two or three words, according to how you write in Greek, because of the angels. Um, and some people, some people have said um, women should be veiled because they don't want to tempt the angels to want to have sex with them. And that's definitely one of the meanings that the ancient world had. Um, they interpreted Genesis 6, which talks about the sons of God coming down and mating with the daughters of men. And they say that's angels having sex with human beings, human women. So somehow people will say Paul believed that if a woman covered her head, in fact, I use the term uh, prophylactics, um, you know, the veil is a prophylactic for Paul against the invasion of women's bodies by bad angels. Mm. I, you know, to get out of modernity, you have to use all kinds of moves. You have to say, number one, angels aren't all good. Right. Throughout most of history, angels could be just as bad as they could be good. So there are lots of bad angels in history. And Paul, for Paul, he believes that they're as likely bad angels as good angels. And so maybe he meant that the bad angels would want to have sex with the women if they saw their heads uncovered. But why would that make a difference? And so I speculated, well, in a lot of medical, ancient medical texts, the head was seen as the... Uh, other part of the body linked to the genitals. The head was the upper entry to the body and the genitals were the lower entry to the body. And so just as you should, in fact, Paul makes this comparison, just as you should keep your genitals covered, so women should keep their heads covered. Um, but, you know, that's just, that's again, guesswork. Yeah, interpretation. Uh, and, and based on some, I mean, there's evidence there. You're just, nobody knows for sure. Yeah. The, now the, the, the hot one, right? The hottest one, Dr. Martin, that I had memorized. And I still to this day know men with men working that which is unseemly burned in their lust one toward another. Uh, there, there's something recompense, you know, anyway, you get the point that's King James only. I was a King James only as back when I was a fundy, um, Romans chapter one, all creation, you know, is, is evidence. Um, but he's got a list of those who are the condemned. How do you understand this passage? And in light of the fact that we assume Paul's never been to the this church in Rome, so he's kind of writing his CV. Here's my CV. Join, you know, believe in this gospel. What are your what's your take on this in Romans one? Well, I, I basically say uh, Paul could be talking about male on male sex. We just don't know. But if you take for example, this is one of the parts of my article on Arsenicoites. If you take all the times in the first two or three centuries that the term Arsenicoites occurs, it's almost always in Christian texts. And it's almost always in context. It's almost it's never used just to, to nobody ever says, now don't commit arsenicoites, and I'm gonna to explain to you what that means. They never say that. Right. They just give you a string of list of things that you're supposed to avoid. These are we call them vice lists in scholarship. And, you know, there's always uh, stealing, uh, mistreating widows, uh, robbing other people. Um, but if you, I went through and I said, okay, when you find Arsenicoites listed in these passages of text, what are the other sins? And they're not sexual sins. Hmm. They're economic sins, like cheating your fellow human being. And I say, now this is important because say you get to the Acts of John, which is second century, sometimes into the third century document. The Acts of John has a couple of different lists of vices that Jesus points out. In one of them, arsenicoites occurs. And that's in the list of sins that are economic sins. That's robbing your poor neighbor, 
charging interest, um, that sort of thing. Now you go later in the Acts of John, there's a list of sexual sins that include things like idolatry, uh, I'm trying to think of the word for general illicit sex, porneia, for example. Um, and all the, li all the terms in that list are sexual sins. Now, where in that list does arsenocortes occur? It doesn't. If arsenocortes was originally a reference in the Acts of John to a sexual action between two men, it should occur in the sexual list, not in the economic list. And so I say, apparently, we could use this as evidence that arsenocortes, even in Paul's day, didn't refer to simple sex between men. It referred to the taking advantage of a man via sex for financial purposes. Hmm. But Prostitution no, in a way, right? It, yeah, that could be being a pimp. That could mean prostituting out your slave, who's a male, uh, to have sex with women. And so you just look back at the use of these terms in there. That's the way dictionary writers actually write definitions. They look at the context of the word and what the word could possibly mean in this context. What do we do with the females or the, the, so it says that women with women, right? Same thing. Would you apply that same thing to women being prostituted as well? Well, see, there's your mistake. You were the one who said it was the same thing. Well, no, I mean, as far as what you were just saying about how it's taking advantage of possible, it's possibly taking advantage of a male uh, being prostituted or pimped or taken advantage of for financial reasons. Would we say the same thing in Romans one, possibly for the women there where it says, um, Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another men with men working that which is unseen. I'm reading a specific translation. I can go to a different one. And there, that's the thing about the translators too. Like they don't all use the same terms when they're, when they're translating this, but women with women, you know, leaving the natural use of the body. Is that also probably in the same category you were just describing? I think that modern people take that forsaking the natural use of the body as being heterosexual sex. Right. And that's a modern account. I would say, I've said, Paul could just mean that um, women are supposed to be on bottom. And I do believe that Paul believed that women were supposed to be the, uh, the submissive bottom in sexuality with a man. And that was the big sin for Paul was the disruption of the hierarchy. Paul was very hierarchical. And so, I think what he's saying is that it's what people do is they say, they take that word that's translated likewise mm -hmm. in the Greek, in the English. And, but it doesn't mean, so what does likewise mean there? It doesn't necessarily mean likewise, women are exchanging sex with women for sex with men. That's just introducing the whole topic. It's what we really mean when we say begging the question. I get so mad when journalists and even scholars sometimes say, well, that begs the question. And then they ask a question and you go, that's not what begging the question means. Right. I've, I've been guilty of that in the past. Yeah. Begging the question <laughs> is a, is a technical term of debate. And it means you're using in your side of the debate, something that is itself up for debate. So when people say, well, Paul says, likewise, women with women, well, he must mean women having sex with women instead of men. Well, what can he mean women who have sex with women with is dis disrupting the hierarchy hierarchy? One woman being on top. People in the ancient world di didn't generally didn't have any idea of what egalitarian sex could be. If you had intercourse, there had to be a penetrator and a penetratee. That's just the way they thought. And so if you say women with women, well, okay, who's the top? Who's the bottom? So it may not mean at all women forsaking women with sex with women for sex with men. It could be women 
getting on top with another woman or another man. It could just it could mean a woman being on top of a man. Right. Did, See, how, uh, isn't there a Jewish? Happen? Isn't there a Jewish writing where Adam's first wife literally this is the problem in their sexual situation? I think so. Although I couldn't tell you where to find it right now, but yeah, I seem to kind of have come into that. Yeah, Lilith was like wanting to be on top of Adam, and right. Adam was like, uh, uh-uh. uh, and. Yeah. <laughs> And, and one more thing that you said that I think is interesting, later rabbis, the way that they dealt with this, well, no man penetrated them and they tried, they like rationalized their way in saying, well, there was, look, okay, so what they scissored, who, who, who cares? Come on. And they got yeah. over it, you know? Yeah. So it's an interesting point you're, you're bringing up. Yeah. This, this just goes to the point about interpretation and that I keep trying to make is please, please, please look at the words don't read a paragraph and then think you automatically know what it all says. Look at the exact words and go back in history and try to figure out what is the meaning of these exact words and what is the scope of the meaning? Because you're never going to get to the one single meaning, but you can get to a, sco- a range of meanings. And that's what you use to do the interpretation. Thank you. So just, I, I want to actually echo in a way what you just said. Um, if you're if you're hearing Dr. Martin today and you're somebody who knows somebody that is radical or they think they have the answer and the understanding of what is being met here and they're weaponizing this book, refer this this book that Dr. Martin has written if they're interested in actually knowing some some uh, refutations or arguments maybe that give other alternative explanations. But it also lowers your confidence in thinking that this is just an outright condemnation of any and every deed or act. And another thing is, I'll even go further. Suppose the hierarchy, I like, I like his hierarchical uh, position here where he's talking about how it's more of a power struggle. We live in a different time. So let's move on. Let's get out of this uh, this 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 model Uh and, and that's my encouragement to the audience. So, Dr. Martin, can we get to Q and A and take some super chats? And sure, I really enjoyed this. You're, by the way, it doesn't just focus on this. The book goes into much many other things, but I figure why not highlight these particular uh, topics? Okay, go into the top. And while we do, I need to give everybody some visuals to look at here. This is the book we're discussing. Get you a copy: Sex and the Single Savior by Dr. Dale Martin. And I hope we can do more down the road on your other books. So that is my, uh, my little, uh, request to you, Dr. Martin. At some point, I'd love to have you back to do more. Um, okay. First super chat. Someone says brave new history says, love your YouTube lectures. Get out your bibbles. Thank you so much for that love and support. I really appreciate it. Brave new history. Go subscribe. Constellation Pegasus. Is Dell a Christian or atheist? Uh, Christian. Episcopalian. Episcopalian. Thank you, Constellation, for the super chat. Really appreciate the support. Brave new history says it's Cain and Abel, not Cain and Mabel. <laughs> Is that something you've you've lectured on before or something? No, but I used an example. Uh the conservatives who says God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Right. And I always say, well, then who made Steve? (laughs) Oh, good one. Nick Flores. Thank you, Nick, for that super chat. I'm just trying to get everybody covered here. I didn't see us. I didn't see a comment. Thank you, Nick. Oh, you got one right here. I loved your book, sex and the single savior. My question is how did ancients view or ancient views of the body affect the way sex was acted out and viewed in antiquity? Good question. Oh, that's really hard because uh, we can tell from different social sources in the ancient world. When, when most of us scholars talk about the ancient Greeks and Romans viewed sex like this, they're basically talking about the educated people, philosophers. So we can go to Plato and Aristotle and, you know, Plotinus and all these different people and, And when, when I can sometimes come across as being overly clean in saying, that's not the way the Greeks thought about sex. This is the way the Greeks thought about sex. But if, when I'm doing that, I'm actually, I usually have to send the procreate, procreate, well, the warning, Mm -hmm. 
precaution, what is the word I'm looking for? Right. Uh, that uh, there were lots of other ways of ancient people thinking about sex. And uh, one of the, some of the places to go to is, um, well, we might call it ancient pornography. Um, get a book of art for Pompeii and look up the wall designs for the whorehouses in Pompeii because we have enough of them. And, and in fact, Herculaneum is even better because more of the walls, mm -hmm. more of the walls survived in Herculaneum than in Pompeii. Well, you would walk into a, prost a prostitution. What's the word I'm looking for? Oh, well. You could walk into a, a place of prostitution and um, the walls would be painted with all kinds of pretty rough paintings, uh, often not very well done, of all kinds of people in different se sexual positions. And we think the, re the reason this was done this way is because a lot of people didn't really know how to describe what they wanted. But they could just walk in, you know, to the whorehouse and say, I want that and point to a picture. And it could be of a man and a woman or a man and a man or a woman and a woman or whatever, or two men and a woman or, you know, any combination of the above. And we know that there were these pictures that are, were out there because we, they survived in archaeology. Now, what did they exist for? What were they there for? And some of us think, well, they were there for advertisement. They're there to say, you know, you can get this here. Um, just point to it. So, but the, the thing is, the idea that men were always supposed to be on top, no way most people bought that. Right, right. I was going to say that that becomes like the don't touch cookie jar that yes. every man's going to want. If you tell us not to do it, honey, get on top. I'm not playing. <laughs> you know? Cause you're going to want what you're not supposed to have. It's just how and the other, go. one of the other sources for this, that was actually a bit more explicit are the ancient novels. So you get, um, uh, the novel called Lucius, the ass, um, Lucius, the donkey, um, or sometimes called metamorphosis because yep. he's changed from a human being into a donkey and he's changed from a donkey back to a human being at the end of the story. Well, there's the beginning of the thing is all about him having sex with this slave girl and all the different positions that she wants him to use with her and just like pages of oh wow them having sex and, and they say that our generations are getting worse <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> nobody was worse than the greeks and the romans believe me <laughs> um and uh in fact these when i was in uh college and grad school we would, you know, s sneak those books out of the libraries, sneak because we didn't want people to know we were actually checking them out. Because uh, <laughs> they're kind of straightforward porn from the ancient world. And, but, you know, we'd be reading this stuff and you'd go, you know, I can't believe they're, you know. And then you'd, if you were reading in a Loeb Classical Library, you know, do you know the Loeb Classical Library series? Yes. Okay, so you've got, English translations, but on the left-hand side of the page, uh, you have the original Latin or Greek, the green ones for Greek and the red colored ones for Latin. And so you could glance over, if you're Greek or your Latin weren't very good, you can glance over just to see what kind of, what word they are you they using here, you know, for sex or whatever, masturbation, for example. And, uh, and then so you can read along in the English, but you can let your eye wander over to the left hand side of the book and you can see, OK, what are they saying in Greek or Latin here? And you can see that, um, you know, uh, there's lots of different ways to translate this stuff, too. And so there's a big translation problem, but uh, sometimes the left hand side of the I would I don't know what I was going to say is that when I was younger, uh, these books in the library, they were so, the people who published them and then 
ran the libraries were so purient that they wouldn't even translate some of these books into English. Right. They would take the Greek, the Greek would be on the left-hand side of the especially nasty verses of uh, Lucian the Ass, in which there's tons and tons of pages about his, how big his dick is. And then you go, you, the right-hand side would usually be an English translation, but you read along in the Greek and then you look over, I wonder how they translate this into English. It's not in English, it's in Latin. Mm. And it's because they don't want the uneducated people to be able to see what's in the text. That's funny. That is, there's so many funny things I'm sure that you can account for in history that, that do that. Oh, it is amazing. Mike, thank you. Is it Kahi? Derek, do you know Theoretical BS, OG creator on YouTube? I'd love to see you call him out of retirement for an interview. Would be fascinating to see two of my heroes talk. Thank you for all you do. I do not know who this is. Can you email me? Uh, with this uh, creator's information, I'd be happy to reach out. I'm loving this conversation here, Dr. Martin. This is, I always enjoy this. Farsight, do we know anything about the Qumran people may have thought about what they thought about homosexuality? They were, as far as we know, they were very much against it. Um, but they were against, you could be kicked out of the community for putting your hand under your robe. Um, or at least one of your hands, maybe your right hand under your robe, because they figured you were just doing that to feel yourself or to get nasty. Um, they were very, very strict about showing nakedness so that even though this is an all, some of these were all male communities. We think we, it's not sure which of the Qumran groups were all male and which of them had some women, because we have found female skeletons mm -hmm. in a few of the cemeteries. So some people have said, well, there were women there even if they weren't super important for the community. But we think that there were, it's a predominantly male community, but even in that, uh, they penalized men who allowed other men to see their naughty parts. So if you happen to be taking a pee in the desert and another member of the community walked up on you and you happened to take a glance at your penis, that was considered a sin right there. Dang, so, really. They never bathed together, as far as we can tell. They never got naked together. They were, and so you, you can tell, well, they were obviously concerned about what we would call homosexual attraction. Otherwise they wouldn't, they would have thought, well, there's, they would have been more like a 1950s high school gymnasium, you know, where you didn't dare question that one man would be sexually aroused by another man's naked body in the shower. You just weren't allowed to suggest that. And that's kind of the way we get the idea about a lot of the Qumran writings is that uh, th they weren't like that at all. They were, they were very strict about keeping no nakedness, no nudity, period, mm -hmm. among, e even among, you know, two men or two women. Wow. Thank you for that. That also and tells us, that's also a clue into something else people that, some of us try to destruct the uh, modern idea of in the modern world, especially after the 19th century, but before 1960, let's say, um, most people bought into the ideology that, you know, women weren't attracted to other women, period. They just weren't. And most men weren't attracted to other men. Only freakish men were. Well, in the ancient world, they were never fooled by that. They figured everybody was attracted to everything. Uh, and so they didn't have a category of homosexuality because right. they just thought every man would find a beautiful, young, naked man attractive, whether he was in the habit of bedding down men or not. So, yeah, the categories, that's a whole nother. I love learning about this, too. Um, Andrew, thank you for the super chat. Did Jesus and Paul comment on premarital sex? Jesus, no. Um, Paul. I think we can assume that Paul thought it was wrong. But I can't think of any passage where he explicitly says so. Can you? 
The only one that keeps coming to mind is that whole, if you're burning for, you know, you're burning, do something about it. Go ahead and marry. But um, I don't know if one can walk away with that and interpret that to mean like, don't, you know, don't not have, don't have sex, you know, until, I don't know. I mean, maybe we're reading too much into it, you know, with our modern yeah. conceptions. Well, when I wrote about that passage, I said, the main thing we can take away from this passage is that for Paul, the problem for him was not so much sex as it was desire. Paul viewed sexual desire, erotic desire as polluting. And so he kind of tries to get for him. And this is where I use the word prophylaxis in my work. This book, and I did it because it sounds so counterintuitive to modern people, including modern Christians. For Paul, marriage is a prophylaxis against desire. You get married and you have sex within marriage, so you will never again experience desire. So you and that's the logic of the passage. Otherwise, right. it, the, the logic doesn't make any sense. <laughs> A lot of people's logic in the ancient world to me is like, yeah, you know, they're working within their own confines of whatever they have. Right. Constellation Pegasus, uh, thank you for the super chat. Says, so no answer if homosexuality is okay from the Bible. This issue of being on top is related to Lilith is interesting. Evidently, she was real because the rabbis mentioned her many times. I think that Lilith is legend or mythology, better yet. I would go so far as to say I don't think there's a, a memory to this at all. And I think they kind of invented her to use this as a example of how the hierarchy should be. Um, an interesting thing though, I've had scholars like even Joel Baden and others. I, I wrote private message and I said, Hey, what do you think about David and Jonathan? He wrote a book about King David and he says, he thinks the authors left the language ambiguous on purpose because you can read into that clearly and see that they had much more than just, Oh, he's just my bro. Like a deep brotherly love. No, like this is, I think they had a real romantic relationship the way it's read. I think it's understood to, to it could be understood that way without having to trip over oneself. So I don't know if there's a flat out condemnation. What are your thoughts? Or if there's even a positive view of it? I think there were people, Jews at the time who had, positive views of male same-sex relationships. I think that particular author did not. I take a cue though um, from the way, from Saul's condemnation. If you'll notice, King Saul is the one who's the most upset about this. Right. And he doesn't, he gets mad at David and throws his spear at him and kicks him out of the house and everything. But it's to Jonathan, his son, that he says, you are what defiling your mother's bed or you're shaming your mother. Mm -hmm. Well, now what does that mean? Well, if you look around at other parts of the Bible, shaming your mother means having sex in a way that's not appropriate. So Saul is accusing Jonathan. And I think what Saul is accusing Jonathan of doing is letting David be on top. Because he's more submissive. He's the one who you could tell is submissive in that relationship. Yeah. That is interesting. I also thought, and that this is just throwing it out there, maybe it plays a role, maybe it doesn't. I also thought about how are you going to like give me children, grandchildren? Like How are you going to keep procreating in this circumstance? Because he's wanting you know, to keep the seed going, right? That's what I thought of. Um, and maybe keep the, them being in charge, right? So Saul's hoping to keep the kingship to his descendants and uh, it's not going to work if he's not having babies. That's one thing that came to mind, but I could be easily reading into that. I like well, the I idea. Think that, I think that could easily be a uh, one uh, possibility and one, one of the possible different meanings. But I think if you read those few verses and there are only a few verses um, with a, a, an ear to shame language, shame and honor language, it's chock full of shame language. Yeah. Jonathan is the one being shamed. Now, why is that? Wouldn't David be shamed just as much as Jonathan if the main, ob the main thing that Saul's opposed to is simply homosexual sex? But he seems much more concerned about Jonathan being shamed. Mm -hmm. 
Well put. Yeah, I I have one question once we get through these here. Imnag, thank you. This is why dogma in Christianity is so dangerous. If you believe in Christ, you have absolutely no free will. Thank you for making all these topics available. What? Well, you are a Christian, so how do you address this? Because you see the dogma. You see the fight that is going on over and over. How do you particularly address it in light of that super chat? Uh, well, for one thing, I would throw away the word dogma because it's too loaded with negative connotations. And I've just used the word doctrine, teaching. And I don't think you can have Christianity with just the Bible. Um, the Bible is not coherent. It's not, the Bible is not Christian. Let's just say that. The Bible is pre-Christian. And if anybody wants to claim to be a Christian, they're going to have to probably accept some doctrine. For example, the doctrine of the Trinity is, in my view, uh, and, and what I, the reason I choose to show myself, to call myself uh, doctrinal and orthodox is because I go to a church, I get up and say, say the Nicene Creed every Sunday. I say the Apostles' Creed if I'm there at morning prayer or evening prayer. Um, and, you know, I confess the Trinity. Well, this, the Trinity is not a doctrine taught in the New Testament as a doctrine. You can find pieces of it. You can find references to the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, sometimes all three in one place. But that's still not the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is the, is the teaching that these are three persons, not just three ideas or entities. They're three persons who are all uh, members of, they're all representatives of God, full representatives of God. Mm -hmm. But they don't, take, they don't take the place of each other. They're all three uh, co-divine and co-equal. And you kind of have all of that together for the doctrine of the Trinity. Well, you could never believe that if all you were, if you limited yourself to only the language of the Bible, because the language of the Bible doesn't get that far. You had to have the second century and the third century uh, before you had uh, Christians. And the re and why do you have this? Well, you have Christians who are reading their Bibles, but they also have gotten into the habit of going to church, and they you know they stand up and they say these creeds that have developed over time, and the creeds develop just because. Uh, Christians need ways to define their faith mainly to themselves. My advocacy of doctrines is not to say you have to believe this. It's just to say, this is what I believe. And this is the way I make sense of the different things I confess. Mm -hmm. If I confess that God the Father is not the same as God the Son, how do I explain that? Well, then I have to get into uh, theological discussions about that. So... Um, I would say I would just say, let's dispense with the word dogma and just say doctrine. Now I can't remember the last half of that quotation. That question. Yeah, it was uh, scrolling up here. So if you believe in Christ, you have absolutely no free will. Thank you for making all these topics available. Again, that's a because someone's a believer in Christ, they have no free will. That that's just something somebody pulled out of their ass in the modern world. Um. Most Christian, most the Christian church has always believed that Christ is divine. The Christian church has also always believed that free will exists. And they might also believe that predestination exists and can override free will. But the balance between free will and predestination is a complex theological uh, doctrinal discussion, which we could go on for days talking about. I mean, they did. Uh, you know, look at history. People went on for centuries. It's like uh, all they did most. <laughs> yeah. You know, in, in the Protestant church, it, extremely so. And the Catholics just kind of said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go. You Protestants are overly concerned about God trying to get everybody to agree with you. We just say, the Catholics just say, we just know there's free will and we know that there's predestination. And, uh, you know, so we just believe both of them. Um, and the Protestant, Protestant, Christianity really screwed up a whole lot of stuff in Christianity because it was this overly rigid idea that you have to believe one thing. Right. You can't hold two thoughts in your brain at the same time. So yeah. the idea that you can't be a believer in Christ and not also believe in free will and still also believe in predestination. 
Um, all those are modern inventions, really not until much the 18th or 19th century. The reason a lot of people in the modern world have very bad understandings of theology is because they know very little about history. Hmm. They know more about scripture than they do history. But to really interpret this book intelligently, you need to know the history of how it has been interpreted for the past 2000 years. Cause that's relevant. Yeah. I love, I love learning how people did this. Uh, we get lost in this, but Athanasius, how he interprets book of revelation versus how Eusebius understand how different people, Irenaeus, of course, the first guy I think who's actually trying to say, Hey, look, we're being persecuted. Maybe this is prophesying us. Martin Luther did this. He first rejected it. Then he's like, no, this is about us in the Roman Catholic church. Uh, just the way that people negotiated with these texts is interesting. Constellation Pegasus says, so what does the Bible or not condemn homosexuality. So it's like, I think that, and, and can I speak, like you tell me if I'm right or wrong here, but I'm going to like speak on your behalf. Um, the Bible is not one message. So like in a way you might find something that might be condemning certain acts that would categorize as homosexuality today. Um, but that category itself is a modern conception, the way that we're, we're labeling it. But maybe there is overlap between certain actions we would say today, would be labeled as homosexuality. The Bible has places where it may condemn that. Are there any places where it doesn't do that? So how would you want to address this? Does it condemn it or does it not condemn it? Uh, I have to go back to more fundamental issues of hermeneutics, biblical interpretation. Often when I talk about these things, I hold up a copy of the Bible. Now this is actually just a copy of the Greek New Testament. I just happen to have it on my desk right here. So you have to pretend this is a copy of the whole Bible. Mm -hmm. And I hold it out on the lectern in front of the audience. And I say, somebody says, well, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? And I'll say, okay, well, here's a Bible. Let's hear what it says. And I plop it down on the podium. And I say, I say, okay, I gotta turn this off. I say, shh, don't say anything. We need to listen. You know, I don't want you talking because I don't want to hear what you think. I want the Bible to tell me what it thinks. And, you know, you, you keep just kind of pushing this and saying the Bible doesn't speak. The Bible can't speak. The Bible is an inanimate object. It's a text. Mm -hmm. It has to be interpreted. So the Bible only has meaning for how it's interpreted. It, the Bible has never spoken in its entire existence. And we can't force it to speak now. You could put it on a rack. Put it on a rack and squeeze all the blood out of it that you want to. <laughs> you'll never, you'll never get the Bible to say anything. Right, right. It's the best under torture because it won't speak. So that's what I first say: is that does the Bible condemn homosexuality or what? That kind of simplicity is that's the property of dummies. People who actually read texts know that that's not a very good question. Thank you for answering. Appreciate it. I kind of figured you could find if you're if you're trying to glean certain instructions that might be condemning certain things, you can find things that might overlap. But the category itself was one that I would say is a modern conception as well, because you're talking about a completely different system in which they lived. So if we take the whole the Bible doesn't speak, but we assume it is giving us information and we're trying to interpret it the best. You may find condemnation that overlaps with what we call homosexuality, but I would imagine also there are probably it doesn't speak about certain things, which would mean it's not condemning certain things, which when in a sense you could say is actually saying that's OK. It's these things we're saying aren't OK. Um, See there again, that's not that's not radical enough for me. I want to say stop giving uh, personal agency to a text. This is our habit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What does the Constitution say about democracy? Well, it doesn't say anything. You have to interpret it. Right. Uh, what does the Bible t do about this? Well, the Bible doesn't do anything. People use the Bible to do things with it. And I, I just keep trying to shake people out of this idea that you ascribe um, agency to inanimate objects. 
and say, okay, then what is that? When you do that, what are you doing really? You're taking agency away from yourself without admitting it. People who do this thing, oh, I'm not condemning gay people. The Bible is. It's not my fault. It's the Bible's fault. You just shoved off on the Bible what you just did. You just did it. I heard you do it. So stop blaming it on an inanimate te text. The text has no agency. The Bible is a book. Books have no agency. Now, there are people who would argue with me all the time about that, saying, oh, but I just can feel it when I'm reading a really good book, you know, that this is it's speaking to me. Well, that's because you have a human brain, and human brains are very complex things, and they can project agency onto everything else around us. Thank you so much. This is There's a lot there to, to unravel. Dr. Romana? What implications does the expression giving in marriage, Matthew 22, 30, have for the existence of sexuality after the resurrection? Does this say anything about forms of marriage, such as in implying monogamy? I don't know that it would say anything about forms of marriage implying monogamy. That would be going quite a ways beyond what it says. Giving in marriage just says, uh, yeah, there are, there are people who are, that's the passive form of marrying. And a lot of the ancient languages, they say you either marry or you're given in marriage. And usually that's understood to be that the man is the one who marries and the woman is the one who was given by her father or her brother or her elder to the man for marriage. So giving in marriage, uh, I assume that what the questioner is, is referring to is the fact that Jesus is saying this in Matthew in a context in which people are talking about what is going to be the existence of this thing after the resurrection? Right. And I think that it's quite possible that Matthew anyway, I don't think this is true for all the uh, biblical writers. I think it's, you can easily say that Matthew may well have assumed that people in the resurrection would be married also, except, you know, there's that passage that, where Jesus says, you know, people, in the resurrection, people will be like the angels. And that means not marrying. Right. Thank you for that. Pan's Pot says, sorry, I missed the beginning of the stream. Was Jesus gay? So this, let, let me bring up my question in light of this. I don't know if you've read this book by Theodore Jennings, W. Yep. Jennings Jr., The Man Jesus Loved. I did an interview with Jennifer Grace Bird, uh, wonderful, wonderful people. And this is a good question. Was Jesus gay? Asexual? Uh, I know of a Jewish scholar who speculated Jesus was married. Isn't it strange for 30 years to be single, by the way? Love your work, Dr. Martin. Uh, love, by the way, love Dr. Martin's work. I ask because I know there are other ways to interpret, but it also, if you're assuming John has been written to a Greek audience, as you point out, Greek and Roman world, like this was the norm that a, a teacher would have kind of a protege that was his lover things like that are they paint i'm not saying what jesus himself literally was because those are two different questions maybe you want to answer that for the for the uh the super chatter but like john's portrayal do you think that this has jesus seen um in some category of actually having relationships with uh what who calls the beloved disciple um I think any of that is possible. I think that I think there are enough uh, there are enough texts that hint around about Jesus and his relationship with his male disciples to say that he had those relationships and that they were physical. And I think most of those come from the Gospel of John, as a matter of fact. Right. I think um, Jesus's relationship to Thomas is highly erotic in the Gospel of John. Uh, I even talk about this as Jesus allowing men to put their fingers inside of him and, uh, you know, this sort of thing, uh, to penetrate his body, which you norm a man would normally wouldn't do. Um, but, um, and I think that, I think that people who say Jesus was probably married, uh, they have the perfect right to say that. I don't see the evidence for it. Um, there's just, there's no hint in any of the ancient texts that Jesus had a wife. Um, 
Now, the counter argument is occurred in that question also, which is, wouldn't this be highly unusual for someone being 30 years old without being married? And there's, that's a simple answer. No, it was not unusual. <clears throat> I've written on this in a few places. The best evidence is just to go to um, funeral inscriptions. And I've studied hundreds upon hundreds of funeral inscriptions for all different purposes, mo mostly for ancient, discover what ancient slavery was like. Hmm. Because that's the best. We don't have books and texts for the most part written by ancient slaves, but we have a lot of their funeral inscriptions. And I've argued, for example, that uh, slaves uh, seem to be almost as likely as non-slaves to have families, even extended families, that is large extended families where, you know, the mother and the father, the grandparents are also involved there, that our brother and sister are also included. Um, and if you just go through all that material and say, okay, what's the age of marriage for this guy? Well, it's 30. Or thereabouts. Now, he may have married a girl who was 14. That was normal for the girl to be married very young. But the man to be married around the year of 30, the age of 30. And that's because uh, there were several reasons. Number one, there were many uh, fewer women in the ancient population than there were men. Men outnumbered women quite a bit. So there just weren't enough women to go around for every man who might have wanted a female wife. Uh, number two, it took money to get married and support a family if, if that was your intention. And men couldn't just kind of start running their own enterprise when they were 20 years old. It took them, you know, years of building up a business before they could even afford to be married. And men were expected to be able to afford to be married mm. unless they could be lucky enough to marry a, a girl that had a huge en uh, endowment, you know, a, a dowry, but that was very unusual. And uh, so, you know, your normal working class man uh, would, chances are he would not be married before he was 30, just because of the financial and demographical issues involved in it. So I've tried to, that was a very popular kind of argument to, to, try to, to try to defend the superiority of Judaism and therefore the superiority of Christian over the Greeks and the Romans and others. Because the idea was, well, Jews were always in favor of marriage and Christianity just interpreted this from Judaism. It was part of its Jewish heritage. There's not a shred of evidence for that in the ancient world. Wow. And it's just a guess on the part of some people. And when you actually look at the different people involved, a lot of these guys were clearly not married, even, you know, into their adulthood. But that seemed not to have been a surprise. Wow. Thank you for that long answer there. Um, I appreciate your answer, Imnag says to you. Thank you. But most evangelical Christian churches are nearly militant, especially on issues of gender. Yeah, they are. So I think you, I think their Imnag is trying to say that you and Imnag are in the same boat here um, trying to dispel some of the, the, the bad uh, that's out there militant, you know, movements against people of same sex or whatever, LGBTQ plus the whole nine. Yeah. Well, the church is, is undoubtedly uh, militant when it comes to the military. Mm, that's true. <laughs> Our job is to go against all of that stuff. I'm with you. I'm with you. All right. We got a couple more and then we're going to wrap things up. Constellation Pegasus is back and says, how can a simple yes or no question on a basic topic be so complicated? In other words, the Bible does not say thus all of the arguments. I thought the Bible was supposed to set matters straight. By okay. the way, a little just, I guess it's worth giving context. Constellation comes from a fundamentalist background like me um, from the Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. So the way we have perceived the Bible you can see has been a major impact in the way that we're also dealing with it after leaving the faith. Yes. Yeah. So. 
Well, I, I try to get people to see this in a broader light than simply the Bible. So, for example, there are some scientists who tell us that um, there's only one universe and we live in it. Increasingly, there are lots of scientists who say, no, there may be two universes and there may be multiple universes. We don't even know how many universes there are. We don't even know the rules of the different universes. So if there's another universe that's radically different from our universe, why would we expect the laws of physics to be the same in that universe as in ours? So if I said, I'm going to force you to make a choice. Do you believe in a multiverse universe or a singleverse universe? No, no, you can't, you can't argue that. You can't have it. You can't say, well, it's according to which science you use. It's according to how you put it. It's according to which language you use. You got to just come right down and make a simple decision. Well, the fact is, it's not a simple decision. Science is never a simple decision. You know, is light, to take an old example, that is light a wave or a, a, a wave or a fragment? You know, a, what's some trend? Is that a particle or something? Is it a particle? Is light made up of waves or made up of particles? No, you can't have it both ways. You just have to make a decision one way or the other. Any good scientist will say, well, we can't make a decision like that because there's evidence on both sides. That true science doesn't insist that you have to make a simplistic decision. It says try to try to stay as close to the facts as you can. So let me rephrase it for him. Christians that say it is condemned and it is abomination, it is reprobates, blah, blah, blah. What do you say to those people who interpret it that way? I say, make sense of that uh, by your life. If you, if you really believe that all gay people are that kind of people, then you shouldn't have any friends like that. You shouldn't allow them in your church. You shouldn't allow them in your home. You should be much more radical in your rejection of them if you really, they are that retrobate evil. If that, they are that much of an evil influence for, the, for our universe, you should be much more militant in opposing them. You should be burning them at the stake. And you're not. Ooh. <laughs> okay. Captain Sunshine, the explanation that the Bible does not have agency is worth the price of admission all by itself. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Well, that's great because I'm. I, if I had any one thing that I wish I could teach most people the most is the Bible does not have agency. Thank you. Bradford Baldwin says, Dodge, the Bible has in it the literal words of God. So it, in essence, speaks for God. You can't believe in God and disbelieve that. It condemns it. And that's that. Plop that on your desk. Well, I just would plop the thing on my desk again and say, uh, if the Bible has the literal words of God, let the Bible tell me that. Why do you have to tell me that? Why are you why are you being a ventriloquist putting the Bible on your hand and going like this? That's what you're doing. You're putting the Bible on your hand and you're saying, I'm not talking. These lips aren't don't look at my lips. Don't look at my lips. My lips aren't moving. My lips aren't moving. It's the Bible that's talking. It's the Bible. See? See the Bible? It's talking, not me. That's all you're doing. It just takes some of us a little bit longer to try to discover that so it's interesting you say that and bradford is is a buddy of mine so we're always engaging with apologists here right i interviewed john j collins uh not too long ago and when i did i i said look at what god says in hosea something i, I pulled up a verse and it was bad i mean when you read it it's sexual it's violent it's what the heck and you know what John did? John, John Slick, he's a buddy of yours. You know, John actually encouraged me a year and a half ago when I interviewed him. He's like, you need to get up with Dell. Um, he said, God said, like the author of this text said, and for me, I don't look, Dell, I'm not a believer anymore. 
right? But I also am not like an antagonist. I really want people to 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 start moving toward a good direction. And he's like, God did not say. The man is saying God said, thus saith the Lord, the guy writing this book. So you really need to judge the the person who's writing this material, if anything, and say, why did he say God said this? So then you get the point. And like, he's like, stop approaching it, thinking God actually said these things. Start realizing the men who wrote this, they're the ones who are showing their own true colors when you're reading this material. So it was a really interesting thing because I had to retitle the video. I was going to say, God said this. And then he, he told me that. And I was like, I'm going to title this. Man is saying, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's it's a really interesting thing to start practicing. But the reason we do that is because overwhelmingly, Dr. Martin, we have Christians who, for example, what did Jesus say? If I asked you, and I meant that to say, read the New Testament, You'd go, actually, that gospel author probably said that, or he didn't say that parable. That parable sounds like a post-war parable, or whatever it might be. You might walk away and say, actually, I don't think that goes back to Jesus. The Christians that you see see that are militant or trying to engage are the ones going, it says it, I believe it, and hallelujah. And like that's the way that they are interpreting the Bible. So we're constantly engaging in that kind of model, if that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. And I, I actually believe that we can't avoid that model. That's why we have to realize that our language has multiple levels of meaning all the time, all the, all the same. You know, it's like I can say um, I can't find my way back to the church. What does this map say? And hand you a copy of a physical map. And I may mean that perfectly literally, except not. Um, it's according to how you take the words. So when I say the map says this is the way to get back to the church, all of that is, um, it's a shortcut speech. It's, it's as if, if you're being a philosopher, you can't stop every time you say something like, I found a text that seems to say that Jesus was born in, um, Nazareth and not Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. Well, somebody, so I say, well, see, look what it says in this sentence here. And someone says, well, you are so stupid if you think that that text says that. The text doesn't say that. You just interpreted it to say that. And then I can just say, well, yes, I could, I could back all that up and say, I'm going to read this text through the lens of modern historical criticism, which supposes that there's an author a human author behind the text who's making it up in the ancient world and and expresses his or her views and it doesn't necessarily ex- exist in history but it, it we may take it to be the views of a human author although the creation of that human author is purely taking place in our imagination we don't have any we don't have any uh, art uh, in the text that shows us a picture of john mark and say, okay, now we know who John Mark is. Well, no, even if we did have a picture of John Mark, that wouldn't tell us who John Mark is. So this is actually a place where, even though I completely agree with what John Collins was saying, as you were quoting him, that I go quite beyond John in my radicalness. Right. In that he still wants to say that the meaning of the text is what this human author who wrote the text meant to say. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, well, yeah, that's one meaning of the text. You could say, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with taking it that way. But you could also just step back and say, from a Christian point of view, that's not the meaning of the text. So yeah, and you and me talked about this, where you see it as almost like you said, well, do you care how Beethoven and and why Beethoven wrote the first symphony and why this and that, but rather how people understand Beethoven today and I think both are worth knowing. I, yeah. I do try to go back and do the John Collins thing, but I also do like to understand because I'm engaging. I have to live with people, right? And so there's a, a sense you want to understand why they're thinking the way they're doing, uh, what they're doing. And usually it's like liberal progressive Christians, buddies with plenty. Like I have no quarrels. There's never really like any issues other than I don't personally understand why I would draw an ontological you know, conclusion 
on this other than maybe I enjoy the tradition or I love the, the whatever it might be something wholesome about it to, to the person. But, um, it's, it's engaging with these, the, the people that you're trying to kind of defang the harms from. So I'm with you and maybe we could do an episode someday on that. I got two more and then let's let you go. Cause I don't want you to go. It's that guy, Derek. I'm never going on there again. <laughs> Bradford says, no, that's not what I'm doing. The Bible adherents have caused so much harm to people that it's inappropriate to claim since it doesn't speak, it's not making claims and giving instructions. Why is it inappropriate? That's a fact. It's a, it's a, it's a physiological identifiable fact that the Bible doesn't speak and is not making claims and giving instructions. So you're saying that to, to let's break this down for a second to Bradford, you're suggesting that it's not the Bible, it's the people who are interpreting the Bible that you're saying are the ones that are technically causing this harm. Yes, it's, it's the interpretation of the Bible that's the problem, not the Bible itself. Same with, you could do the same thing with the Quran and Islam, right? So you Absolutely. have more liberal, progressive Muslims. Then you have radicals that are extremist, and they're all looking at the similar book. Maybe they have different hadith, not sure. How they're interpreting this differs. And this yeah. is why we see different behaviors in people. Yeah, this is, I, I just keep insisting, this is not just theory. This is empiricism. What do I mean by empiricism? You look at the world and you try to describe how it's working. Well, okay, let's put it this way. I have a friend who greatly admires doc doctors, physicians. And he says, he takes me to the hospital and he's wandering around. He says, you see all these people with white coats, their job is to save the world. And I say, oh really? Let's test that statement. Let's you and I just pick out one of these people in a white coat and follow him or her around all day long. Oh, let's follow them for around for a week or a month or a year. Now let's take very copious notes. What did they do today? And you say, at which point in these copious notes, can we just draw a line and says equals saving the world? You can't do that. You can say metaphorically they're saving the world, or if you, they're part of a big complex that involves a lot of human beings saving the world or trying to save the world. But you can't just say that doctors save the world. You have to, in fact, I'm trying to get people to be scientific, be empiricist. Look at what people do with the Bible. Look at what the Bible does and just describe it in ordinary English. Who's the biggest pushback scholar wise that you have that pushes back against this, what you're describing here and how we try to uh, negotiate the meaning of the Bible and such, who would you say scholar wise that has engaged you the most on that? I don't know because I don't read that stuff. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I just figured I'd ask cause I know that there's differing opinions. Snake was right. Says why read the Bible if it doesn't say anything? So this just gets, I think there's a misunderstanding here, but. Because the important thing is not what the Bible says. The important thing is how you read it. So of course you have to read it to have a method of reading. It's just, that's just rational. Someone said, why read the Bible if it doesn't say anything? That's an irrational question. Isn't it? It's, it's a force. It's a, it's a false either or why read the Bible if it doesn't say anything? Well, why listen to music if it doesn't say anything? Music doesn't say anything either. You can get all kinds of communication from it yourself and interpret it and get all kind of meaning from it. But the music's not just handing you that on a platter. 
you're listening to the music and your brain and your culture is what's doing all that interpretation. This is not difficult. It's just a matter of looking at how meaning actually happens. Instead of all these fanciful ideas about how meaning happens, which is what all these people are working with. I was taught that this says this and this says this and this text means this. And they're just piling together a bunch of stuff they've heard of all over their lives and putting it all together in a big mixing bowl and hoping cake comes out of the end. Well, let's take it apart and look at the different pieces. And why read the Bible if the Bible doesn't say anything? That it's an irrational question. I want to phrase a question a, a, a different way, and then we have one left. No more super chats, please. I just have one more here, and that is, if I'm reading in the Hebrew Bible, the LXX Hebrew Bible, either way, and God, te- God in the text, right? As I'm reading this, the text says, and God told Saul, "Go kill all of the Amalekites, every man, woman, and child. Leave nothing alive. Like literally annihilate everything." And I'm reading that. I'm assuming in my mind, right? I'm doing interpretation, which is without a doubt that this is saying God is expecting Saul to kill all these people. Um, that seems to be how everyone mostly other than apologists that I've come across and the apologists that I've come across try to go, well, what it means is, you know, when you go out there and your coach says, kill them or give them hell or beat the hell out of them or something like that, what he means is, is just play a really tough game in football. So they find ways to get out of the meaning of this because it's ugly as it's been interpreted. Um, you know, Go kill such and such. Well, they want to reinterpret on the ugly spots and go, you know, this actually does not mean he's saying kill every man, woman, and child. Though textually, if we're reading and we go along and we go, well, look, it says that he's taking the kingship from Saul because he did not obey the command to kill all the Amalekites, every man, woman, and child, and leave nothing alive. I would imagine that that, yes, there's interpretation, but like the meaning of the words don't the, don't the words have some meaning that we can read and, and, and gain? Or can we just say kill actually means love? Like, like I guess, how far are we going in this, in this direction to where we're not able to know what it actually is saying at all? Can we just make it up and say, actually, God meant to go love every man, woman, and child of the Amalekites because I interpret hate or kill to be love or something. You see where I'm going? Like, sure. isn't there a line? And where is that line? That's that's the thing. I'm like, I'm wondering language is so flexible, but there's a sense in which we all kind of gradually come together in understanding these words to mean certain things in their context. That's why I was wondering where you personally would draw the line. Like if you read that passage, how does that mean to you? Like you probably read it the same way I do. Like, hey, this is some archaic stuff. Like just an older... Uh, uh, an older text that's kind of probably portraying something as we read that is known around other nations. Other nations did similar things. Uh, this literature, this literature saying something that sounds similar to what we see in ancient near Eastern stuff. That's where I'm like, I'm wondering where we draw the line of, do we even know what it's saying at all when we're reading this? Like, do we know how to understand this properly in its context or do we just, can make up anything and let it be anything. And it never really has anything we can glean. Does that make sense? Yeah. Again, you're, you're God, you're getting that same old bad modernist habit of posing an either or and asking your interlocutor to force himself to choose one or the other. And my whole point would be, well, of course it means things. It means lots of things. You're trying to make it mean only one of two things. That's your mistake. And it's your mistake, but it's a mistake mm-hmm. you learned from modernity. Mm-hmm. You read a text and you think, okay, I'm going to follow this down through a series of uh, practices of interpretation until I get to the meaning of the text. And if I can't find the meaning of the text, meaning one meaning, or maybe two, or maybe three, I may let you have more than just one, but I'm not going to let you have multiple meanings because then the text just becomes irrelevant. Well, the text could become irrelevant, mm-hmm. just like most texts 
are irrelevant to most human beings in our world. Right. So uh, it's just it just doesn't make any sense to to say uh, it either has one meaning or it has no meaning. That that doesn't make much sense. I'm just I'm not even saying that it doesn't. I'm trying to just understand what the literature might be saying, and I know that I keep using that word saying. Uh, and, and I think that you're thinking, I'm saying that this text is speaking, but if I'm reading a letter from someone, if I wrote you a letter, um, it, I have meaning I'm conveying to you. If someone read it a thousand years from now, they personally may not know the context, but there are tools we try to use to understand maybe what Derek meant when he spoke, wrote a, re a letter to Martin, uh, Dr. Martin. And I'm saying that, that there's something that we should try to figure out on what it's saying there. And I'm not, I'm not, but I'm not trying to say that it can be anything. Like if he's saying kill every man, woman, and child, you can get down in the nuance and go, actually, maybe what is implied here, we found a Hebraic um, idiom and the idiom might actually give us this kind of notion because we found this in some type of Akkadian literature, Semitic languages that help us glean on the meaning of certain Hebraic words or whatever. Like I'm, I'm saying that I don't think we would walk away and say this means to go and love every Amalekite, uh, every man, woman, and child of the Amalekite. Like, wouldn't there be limitations to how we could? And I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get you to see what those limitations are. Yes, there are limitations to interpretation. Right. Okay. What are the limitations? What limits you from saying? this text is all about loving the Amalekites. I would probably pull up key details in the context that surrounding context that helped me try to come to a conclusion that this looks like war. This looks like killing is involved. In fact, some of the context seems to say he hears someone's alive. He hears cattle. Oh no, those are for Yahweh. We're going to sacrifice the Yahweh. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Everything was supposed to die. And I would probably build up the context of the whole structure and then try to walk away with an interpretation of what was probably implied in the passage. You know, what's missing from all of this in your talk about this, you're not giving it any kind of social context for interpretation. That's where limitations come on interpretation. Mm -hmm. I can't say that, that the U S constitution means anything I want it to mean, but it's not because the constitution raises up its big hoary head and snatches me off the face of the earth and throws me against the ground and tramples me underfoot. Right. So what's keeping me from doing that? Socialization. I've been socialized to believe that's not proper interpretation. I'm not sure what that is, but until I learn something differently, I can't accept that in my world as being proper interpretation. Now that doesn't mean I can just convince anybody out there that I'm right and they're wrong. Right. Meaning is not a thing. It's an entire morass of soup we swim around in. We can't, there's no place to set your feet on solid ground. Um, it's just you swim. Hmm. Yeah, there's so much here uh, to try and like understand about what you're suggesting here. Imnag, the last one, without the Bible, Christianity wouldn't exist. Millions of believers live by its every word, literally. Well, I would, I would agree with that as a historical statement, simply because I can't imagine Christianity still being around without the Bible, because the Bible, I think, carried uh, the social institutions of Christian. Notice, I didn't say the meaning of Christianity. I said the social institutions of Christianity. The Bible kept, helped carry those through by the way it was interpreted and used in monasticism, preaching, sermons, the church, uh, the home. Uh, the Bible has been uh, the thing that uh, I think is most important as a source for Christianity throughout uh, the millennia. But I don't think that's the same as giving the Bible agency for doing it. Mm -hmm. That's when you get into mythology. And Christianity should never be simply another part of myth mythology. So, um, so from a purely historical point of view, I would say, I kind of think you're right that uh, if it weren't for the Bible being 
continually produced. And in, in fact, I've taught before that when some of my students say, when did Christianity become Christianity? I will sometimes say, well, you could say it's maybe the time of Paul. That's about the earliest, maybe the year 150 when you get Justin Martyr writing about it, maybe maybe the year 200 when you get Clement of, Clement of Alexandria writing about it. In other words, you could say there's all different times in history when you could say it's the birth of Christianity. So there's not one time you could say Christianity is born on a Tuesday. Right. In, you know, 19, uh, you know, 413, right after Constantine becomes emperor, you know, that that just doesn't work. It's just too simplistic. There are people who literally think that. Yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I agree with the historical point, but I don't agree with the theological point that seems to be making, that the person seems to make it, which is to say that uh, it is a part of our faith to believe that Christianity can't exist without the Bible. Well, no, that's not a part of Christian doctrine. You know, recite the Apostles' Creed. Where's the Bible? Right, right, right. Yeah, they're, they're definitely uh, the way that they're understanding and interpreting things. Uh, they're applying in the creed. I'm going to give you last word here to speak to the whole world, Dr. Martin, while I show your books and uh, talk to the audience, if you don't mind. About what? Final we, words from you. I don't know. Encouraging words. They need to check covered. out your books. Like what? What's up with the books? Like what? What? What do you feel like saying? How about that? Let's get poetic. Well, I kind of thought we'd gone through everything, but I guess that what I would say is, um, I. The world is a complex thing. I don't want to make Christianity out to be more simple than the world is. Um, I want to accept the complexity of Christianity and its history. And it's scriptures. Uh, you notice that I tend to like the word scripture over the Bible. And that's because scripture is a wider category. The Bible refers to this particular book that's been edited over the centuries. And it's published in different forms. But they're almost all the way it's published are in basically the same form. A few differences here or there. But scripture can refer to, uh, you know, parts of the parts of holy writing that have existed throughout the centuries and never made it into the Bible, but they're still considered by good, pious Christians as being part of the Word of God. The Word of God cannot be limited to the Bible, is what, one of the things I believe. The Word of God uh, is fresh and alive and never ceasing. And so it's a mistake to simply equate the Word of the God with the published printed version of the Bible. The Word of God has got to be bigger than that. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Martin. I appreciate your time. I hope everybody takes the time to help support us as well. Uh, there is a video that Dr. Bart Ehrman did. I have a Patreon. If you want to help us out, come join our club here. And uh, got a lot of stuff coming, courses with scholars, do a lot of work here. And I publish it early to those who help support us. This is the website with the courses, mvp-courses.com. I hope to see you sign up. Uh, we just launched a new one. And I really appreciate you, Dr. Martin. And uh, let's do this again sometime, maybe on some of your other books. Okay. Thank you. All right. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, everybody. Let me see here. All right, Dr. Martin. Um, there we go. Okay. Yeah, so I figured I'd stick around just to chat with everybody for a second here. Um, there's a lot there to think about, but... I think a year, year and a half ago, I, I gave a phone call to Dr. Martin and I wanted to talk about like the Apostle Paul and some of the historical research. We actually had this conversation uh, that you all witnessed and experienced here on the phone. And th in the conversation, he's like, well, what are you looking for? I was like, well, I want to know what Paul, you know, what Paul meant when he wrote his letters that's like a big no-no in a conversation with him because he doesn't believe or think that that can be something you can gain. You can't get into the mind of Paul. You can't get into the mind of the author or try to understand their intent or what the meaning of the words that they're writing are sometimes. You can do historical research, but 
And I've talked to colleagues, of course, of Dr. Martin's in the past, and they have told us, yeah, we have a totally different take on this than he does. The way that he interprets this is unique and different, uh, but we don't we don't draw that kind of a conclusion. We think we can get closer to what is actually being intended by the material that is written than just looking at it as a piece of art. And I remember it stuck with me, which is why I hesitated on doing an interview with him for a long time, because I want, I want to get down to the historical nitty gritty. What was meant by these things? What was, what do these words mean? What do they say? Um, and he looks at the Bible or the, the scripture as art. He equates it with like Beethoven's symphony. And the way that you might listen to a song is different from how I might listen to a song and understand and interpret that, that art, uh, that, that piece of music. Maybe Beethoven intended in writing this or putting his first piece of music out. Who knows? Let's imagine it's Beethoven loved a girl on a certain street down the street from him. And he wrote this because he was inspired by her. The way you're listening to that, you are interpreting it in your own way, right? So your understanding of Beethoven's symphony has zero context to the meaning and purpose that Beethoven may have had. And to me, I don't, I don't look at scripture the same way. Uh, I don't read it that way. I'm not looking at it going, this just, how does this mean to my little group? Christians have done that. And that's important to know why Christians have interpreted things, how they've understood it socially in their communities and such. But like, if, if I read, you know, do not mix fabric in like a, a code, right? I like to ask like, did Israelites really practice that? What is meant by this? Is there any other examples in history where people that were non-Jews or non-Israelites who had a code that might have been something similar to this or kosher food, don't eat certain animals, whatever it might be. Um, I have an idea in my head and it may not be exactly the idea that the author is intending, but I get a good general gist of what I think is being implied here. Um, however, there's a lot of context that I don't know. I wasn't there. Like, Th this is something that what he does do for me is help me try to be very cautious in my approaching this historically because there's so much we don't get. The feminist studies I brought on my channel and the scholars who are pointing out slavery, pointing out things that I never even realized, um, start to come to life when you see them in the text and you go, whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't realize that that was there. And that has a, a an implication I didn't recognize when I read this as a Christian. So... It's hard uh, because you can tell he's also very pushed back against any uh, trying to like get down to the nitty gritty of what the text says, what it means. Even by the words of saying what the text says, the text doesn't say anything. This book doesn't say anything. Here, tell him how you feel. You see, the text doesn't talk. The text doesn't speak. You in your mind, once your your mind reads the words and interprets it, then it has meaning and of course, you're giving it your own spin. And I would imagine there's definitely a lot more methodology involved into what I'm describing, kill every man, woman, and child of the Amalekites. I would refer to ancient Near Eastern scholars and other experts in the field, linguists and others, cultural, social, archaeological, the whole nine to try and get to, can we figure out what this is? At the end of the day, what if the genre was completely fictional and it's made up? Or does it have verisimilitude to historical archaeological data that we can pin it down to? So there's a lot of stuff. You saw the conversation. I don't usually um, sit after a live stream to talk with you about this, but I think it's important to 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 just voice that to you all. You're going to hear different opinions from different scholars. That is what we do, right, on Myth Vision, and and. I just personally, um, I disagree how far he goes. He admits it's radical, right? He, he goes far. Um, but many colleagues of his as well disagree on that. Um, but he has been teaching that for quite some time. And so what I wanted to do is see if there's a specific scholar who is critical of that take and maybe possibly have them on the show so people can understand. Uh, Paul, I think, is writing letters. Unless you take them as epistolary fictions that are made up, I personally see too much. Well, I wouldn't make up stuff if I was making epistolary fictions. I wouldn't have this like really pissed off, irritated guy writing correctional letters to churches. 
that are doing things that he's like, come on, you're supposed to have the Holy Spirit, the Numa, and you guys are still sleeping with your mother-in-law and you're you're suing each other. He's pissed off, it seems, in these letters. But then again, that might be my interpretation, uh, getting in the way of reading Paul's letters. Maybe he's going, now please, uh, I'm not mad, but please stop suing each other. I don't know, right? Um, but he seems upset, especially when he's cut the whole thing off. Galatians, right? Uh, sounds like there's some anger that I'm I'm sensing in the letters. And most academics I talk to, they all agree and concede with me on this point. So maybe we have the wrong method, as 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 he's saying. I personally um, don't draw those kind of conclusions. I don't want to go to fourth, fifth century church interpreters to understand first century material. I'm curious to know why they interpret it in the fourth century, who, what, when, where, why, what's the context, the culture, all of that, that made them interpret this the way I described revelation, right? Why was the book of revelation then made canonized? And it wasn't originally many early voices thought a, her a heretic wrote the book of revelation. Irenaeus had friends who were killed in Rome by the Romans under persecution and read in Revelation about those beheaded and those who are blood spilt, right? The saints' blood spilt. Like, this is how he was reading it, going, This is talking about my time. So he interpreted this as prophecy about his time in the 180s, approximately, give or take. So that became canonized. Later on, Athanasius, and I think Eusebius, but Athanasius was allegorizing and and finding ways to push the interpretation further into his own his own way. So I'm trying to get behind the curtain and meet the wizard and say, hey Paul, what's up, man? What what are you what are you doing here? Why'd you write this letter to the Philippians? Why'd you write this letter to the Romans? I won't know all and I definitely can't even pretend to know that I'll know all the details. But you wrote words and these words, I think at least can I can I guide myself to understand something here? Can I get close to maybe what you're trying to say? Can I pick up what you're putting down? And I'm trying to do that. That was that's my goal. And we had that 30 minute talk, maybe it was an hour the night I called him a year ago. And every time I was shot down on trying to get to knowing what Paul's Paul meant. What did Paul mean? Well, I'm trying to understand like what is it saying here and how does this it doesn't matter what that means and what it says. I kept getting shot down, which is why I postponed the, the, the interview because I needed to first read the works, but I had so much else on my plate that I was aiming at. You finally got to see an interview with me and Dr. Martin. And I even was trying to avoid this, uh, this discussion in terms of that point. I really didn't even want to go back into it, but you super chatters, you forced it. And I was like, all right, all right, all right. you know what? Maybe it is important. So everyone watching can see how he engages it and way he communicates it versus how others do. I get what he's trying to say, but I just don't go that far uh, personally. Topic discuss. Gary in the house. By the way, I've got some interviews coming out with Gary. Gary is a direct descendant of um, William Clayton, the scribe of Joseph Smith. And um, we're reading letters from William Clayton. And if I applied the, the who knows kind of method and it just is meaning how you interpret it, to these letters, I wonder what we'd come out with. But I think we can read William Clayton's letters in his in his uh, biography. I think it is his diary, whatever it is, and understand like what Joseph Smith was saying and like issues that were going on, polygamy, the whole nine. Um, we did this even when we were reading uh, Gary on video. So it applies to what you and me did, Gary. If you haven't subscribed to Topic Discuss, I hope you do. What do you think Paul's intent was and what he meant by in his letters? So what do you, right, me, look, I, like, will look at the scholars, the experts who are Pauline scholars, and literally try to get the, the, the minds who know the language, the letters and such, to try and wrestle and understand what maybe the meaning of some terms are. I don't know if we get down into the meaning of the term we were talking about when it came to same-sex relationships, man with man, women with women. I don't know who's right on this. I could easily go, actually, I think that maybe Paul's condemning the notion of men with men. There is the hierarchical s structure of man being on bottom is not a good thing. You got to be on top if you're a man. Well, how do we know that that's the case if we're, if we're not 
reading historical information to know the practice of the time and such. There's a lot, I think, going on in Paul's letters. Um, what's Paul's intent? Sounds like he's trying to get a community to follow this Christ figure, and they are supposed to do it by the pneuma. The Spirit of God is supposed to be in them. I think Paul, in his letters, based on reading him, he's very mystical. I think this guy's a mystic. I think he's having hallucinatory experiences or something. I once knew a man who went to the third heaven. Like, And the way he talks about Christ in him being revealed, like this guy is a mystic of some sort. And so I imagine he also is apocalyptic in light of some of the near expectations of the coming of the Lord on the clouds. Like, I think this guy is, along with Second Temple Judaism and other literature that we're reading, John J. Collins and such, I think he thinks the end of the world in his meaning history is going to end. So there's a lot that's in Paul's letters. He's trying to convey love. He, he really wants to try and stop the whole urges for sex. And marriage is something where he's like, if you have to, then do it. But I urge, look, the end is happening soon. This is something. But there are scholars who read later in his letters. It sounds like he's kind of changing his mind. He still thinks the Lord's going to come, but he's like not on the edge of his seat. So when you say, what do you think Paul's intent was and what he meant by his letters? Depends on the letter. Depends on the part of the letter. Some of these letters seem to be spliced together, like the Corinthian letters seem to be multiple letters spliced together. Um, he is rebuking, it seems. He is trying to give corrections to people. I think this is a man writing to real people, and he's writing, cut it out. This is how you should behave, and this is what I think he's trying to do to the Corinthian church. And um, just depends on what, what letter we're looking at. But like Galatians. He's, re oh, foolish Galatians. That sounds like stuff that we hear other people. Hey, you fool, why'd you do that? Um, and I think he's writing to them to correct, to let him defend himself, saying, hey, my, my gospel's the right one. It's not a man-pleasing gospel. This is the truth. You don't need to go by law. You don't need to circumcise in order to have Christ. In fact, you make his, his crucifixion all null and void. It's, it's no use if you do these things. What that even means is a, is a very difficult thing to grasp, but there's so much to Paul's letters. There, There's people who spent their whole life studying them, and they still walk away going, I'm not sure what he meant here, or I, I think this is what he meant there. And I love wrestling with the scholars on this. I love to hear what they have to say. And today you heard one that has a totally different take. It's hard for me to wrap my head around everything that he's saying, but he has a different take. Captain Sunshine I thought this was a great interview. I know others were frustrated, but I really loved it. Look, I I already had this talk a year ago in terms of what you what everybody who might be frustrated uh, had. Um, so I kind of knew to anticipate that, but I also know that he knows history. He knows a lot of historical data, and this is one of the things that I was hoping to get into. And we did. We got into some of that. How did Jews think about sex and marriage and? Um, maybe what Paul's meaning by these things. We jump back into Leviticus and get, get his take. I know Eden Dershowitz has a particular take on some of this stuff. If you haven't read that, he thinks there's interpolations in the text and that originally there was more incestual uh, commands to not do fathers and children and mothers and, and sons and things like that. So there might be some stuff there, but uh, I, I enjoyed it. I had a good time and I think he was very respectful to me even if he was trying to go stop because he disagrees with uh, what I'm asking. But I, I enjoyed it, even though we would disagree. Constellation Pegasus in the house. Good. Thank you for the super chat. This makes no sense, Derek. Evidently, the creator of the universe can't write a book the way he wants it. Is homosexuality good or bad is a basic, simple question. No physics or philosophy needed to answer. I understand where you're coming from. And I understand where he's coming from. And so I know that people who, if the text, let's put it this way. If the text in Leviticus is some down derogatory smash of a man laying in the bed with a woman or with a man like he does a woman. And if that is meaning having sex with a man like a woman, not on top or bottom, but just means sex, then I would say it's a condemnation, period, point blank. So it would be against it. And there are many 
Bible exegetes, scholars and such who do take that interpretation. If you get lost into the details of, well, it could simply mean on top or bottom, or it could mean this or that, then you might walk away going, it's condemning something, but it may not be condemning homosexuality as this umbrella thing. It may be specific actions under that umbrella that are condemned, and it doesn't mean any and all acts that are particularly as we define it or understand it as homosexuality. But we get to Paul, and we understand Paul to mean what I just meant about Leviticus, and some scholars do try to splice those words together and have that meaning in Paul, then Paul is condemning the act in some way. But if we get into the nitty gritty, is this a male prostitute? Is this some younger kid being prostituted out? Is this a top bottom hierarchical issue? Maybe it could be multiple facets in one. It could just be the act in itself. I don't know. And so it isn't, this is a, an interesting point you're trying to get. If you're talking to a Christian who thinks this is B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. This tells you the instructions you need to know on how to live your life. It answers all the questions we need to know about life, yada, yada, yada. Well, we just watched an episode where it ain't that simple. And in fact, if you're a Christian who takes this like literally, you're reading probably a translation, which they're already doing some interpretation in the process. Uh, I think the King James Bible uses the word homosexuality in it or at least the new King James can't remember, but like they're running around smashing people with this book. And if he's correct, that we aren't absolutely sure what is being meant here. Then like, why are people using this as a weapon to go smash over people's heads? And I told him before the stream, like I have no core, like, look, the Bible could be condemning it, not condemning it, depending on the passage, but let's just say it did condemn it whoop de doo for me. I mean, it's not like, not the fact that I'm not homosexual, but I'm saying simply put it, it, I have no, like, I don't need the Bible to tell me or be part of my faith or need it for any instructions or anything like that as most Christians. Um, and so it wouldn't matter to me. And I, I imagine the same doesn't matter to you constellation, but we do come from a background that I don't think Dr. Martin, I, he knows of it, but he's like, you know, not really recognizing how that mindset is pushing in until I think I kept showing him that, that the Bible tells us the answer. And if we look at it as God is giving us the answers we need to know, and it's supposed to be just spelled out clear as day in this book, according to Dr. Martin, that's not the case. And um, so to your answer, does the Bible condemn it? I would say, does the Bible teach that God knows all things or does the Bible teach that God doesn't know all things? Well, with that question, if you asked me that question, right, because I'm no expert in the language in understanding what's going on here, there are simple passages, I would say, where God seems to know the end from the beginning, which implies that there's supposed to be an end at some point. But then there's passages where it's like, Adam, where, where are you, Adam? Oh, I shouldn't have made man. Uh, I'll never, I'll never flood the earth again. Like there are passages that seem like God doesn't know all things. What do we do? Does the Bible say God knows all things? Yes. Does the Bible say God does not know all things? Yes. Oh, it says both things. So I don't know what to, how to answer it. And I think people have meshed multiple texts together. Dan McClellan did a video this morning. There is, what, what did he title it? Let me look this up and show you. This is actually an interesting title. It's, it was clever of him to, uh, here we go, to title it this. Here we go. Dan McClellan. All right. Videos. Does, do, 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 do. hold on. Where is it at? There is no God of the Bible, he titled it. Maybe we should watch it uh, together if that is cool with you real quick here. I want to play that, actually. If you haven't heard this, we're about to hear it together. Stop sharing. Share screen. Chrome tab. Audio. Here we go. Hey, everybody. There is no God of the Bible. And I don't mean that in some kind of edge lord, all gods or fairy tales way. I mean it in the sense that the Bible does not present a single depiction of God. It presents numerous different and frequently contradictory 
depictions of God. And so you can't just add them all together and look at the sum and have a fuller picture of God. You just get a tangled paradoxical mess. What you do to get a notion of the God of the Bible is negotiate with the text and center and prioritize certain depictions and then marginalize, reinterpret, or outright ignore other depictions. And all of this is in the interest of making the text more meaningful or more useful for us within a given context or situation, which means any God of the Bible that we find is a situationally emergent, negotiated divine profile, because the Bible is not univocal. It does not speak with a single unified voice, and it does not present a single unified idea of God. Hey, everybody. There you have it. So um, that's, I agree with what he just said, um, and people do negotiate. And usually they, I find Christians mostly negotiate with the positive, the loving side. They want that more prettier God uh, than the uglier, archaic war path God. But imagine if we were in war and act like, like full on the nation, we were in like this post-apocalyptic situation where war was the thing. You might gravitate toward, I am a, I am a man of war God and, and ruthless and like hard on the enemies, the whole nine. Like, and so this is what I imagine how that negotiation might play. I mean, I'm imagining it. Imnag, the word dogma triggered him after that. He just sh shooting everyone down. So I think attached to, because everyone has certain dogmas, I would imagine. Um, and he might have his own, right? That might not like this word here. Uh, but as far as what I think he did by trying to say doctrine, he's trying to take that word dogma and then apply it to doctrine as these are particular teachings that people are believing and I, I know that I, I, I like your word dogma. I mean, I listened to Sam Harris debating, um, debating uh, Jordan Peterson on this. And, you know, it gets back to this Jordan Peterson interpretation. When I did a critical response to Jordan Peterson and, and how he can make anything make mean anything because it's all about the meta narrative and, and he's seeing what he wants to see in this literature without certain methodology, I would say historical critical approaches to understanding these texts. Um, you like, I literally kind of chuckled, but like kill every man, woman, and child. Well, what that means is inside each one of us, there's a man, woman, and child. And the name for that is Amalekite because the meaning of the word Amalekite means, and like, he was asked on the spot, like, do you believe that Jesus resurrected physically from the dead? And there's like a funny little video on YouTube saying it will take me 40 hours to answer that. And I think he actually said that in his correspondence with Sam Harris about, oh, wow, that's such a in, such a heavy topic to, to tackle. Like, it would be so difficult for me to answer this question. And it wouldn't be difficult for me to tell you what I think. No, I don't think he rose from the dead. I think people may have believed he rose from the dead. I would even go so far as to say it might have been part of a legend right out the gate. And people believe in legends all the time. So there might be some overlap between what people believed and what was the common tradition of people who somehow there's like a porous barrier between death and the living world. So I would just say, no, I don't think he literally rose from the dead. And it wouldn't take me more than a sentence to answer the question. I understand complexities and nuance and all that, but when we get into the like meta narrative world, that really started to make me go, anything can mean anything then. Hate means love, up means down, in means out. And like wh where we draw that line on how we know what stuff means, we have to try and use rigorous methodology to try and do that. Yet we may still never know exactly what is implied or meant by certain things. So anyway, I did see that he was like, yo, 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 no, dogma, I'd rather use doctrine. But I didn't see him get as triggered as I thought he was when we kept talking about the Bible speaking. And he had a reaction to that that he was not a fan of, right? He's not a fan of us saying the Bible says or the Bible speaks or this is what the Bible means because there's always negotiation. And in some way, I know that I have certain bias. I have certain filters through which when I'm looking at these texts and maybe I'm not there living in that context to know what actually is meant by some of this, but I think we can get close. I don't want to pretend that we can't 
achieve something and I'm trying to understand. And we have to do it with a lot of data, archaeology, social construct, really studying multiple things to try and get down to maybe what is implied or meant in certain text. My thoughts. So Constellation Pegasus, got uh, getting to the bottom of particle wave duality seems to be easier than Bible interruption. interruption. I think you mean Bible interpretation. But yeah, like <laughs> which one's easier to get to the bottom of? Well, I, I don't know because I don't know particle wave duality. But I, I'm going to say this. There are some things we just don't understand. And that's a reason why there's debates and scholars debate passages. And it's endless because we don't have Paul to interview. Hey, Paul, what did you mean? But imagine Paul shows up in my studio. All right, sit down, buddy. Hey, necromancer, thanks for bringing the guy back because he wasn't going to rise from the dead anyway until you brought him back. Anyway, Paul's here. So, Paul, we're going to ask you, Paul. Paul, what did you mean when you said this word in Romans chapter one? People are using it to say that these people should be condemned. They're reprobates, blah, 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 blah. And we have the category called homosexuality, yada, yada, yada. What do you mean? And Paul goes, you know, I forget what I meant in that context, actually. Uh, I don't know. Or maybe he has a certain thing he meant, and we don't really know. Um, but memory, right? Like, what if he forgot exactly what he meant when he wrote these letters? Don't know. Don't know. Tough to do, right? But I think there's some things that we can pretty much have good confidence in and knowing what they probably meant in their context. My thoughts, again, um, some of you might actually side with what was being said by um, Dr. Martin. And to each their own, I just don't. I don't go that far. Look at the flowing live. Derek out here winging it like us. We teach myth vision. <laughs> Jay, good to see you here. Go subscribe to Jay. Jay's doing a lot of good stuff, and I'm hoping to get a – he's two-time PhD. I'm hoping to get a course or two with him. Sex and evolution, and then I uh, can't remember the name of the other one we're planning on doing. Greg Royce, 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 forgive me if I butcher that. Yell Open Courses, Martin New Testament and Hayes Old Testament sparked my passion. Biblical scholarship led me to Myth Vision. Great interview, and I think the clip better articulates Martin's point. Get Dr. Hayes on Myth Vision. She's good. Yes, she is. I've been emailing her for over two and a half years, and I have had her respond twice out of dozens, I'd say at least probably 20 emails over two and a half years that I've tried to uh, get her to, to come on to do interviews. She is one of the hardest ones that I've had a difficulty. I mean, I've had Elaine Pagels on Bart Ehrman, the like upper echelon of like what people say are the most popular scholars. And, um, she has been very difficult to get on. I have loved her series. Uh, what's so divine about divine law to her Yale series where she's lecturing. I've read some of her works on academia and her book, um, really diving into the whole Goy Goyim thing and the birth of the nations, all that stuff. I love all of it. Uh, I'd love to get her on, but I'm trying my best, Greg. So bear with me. I hope she'll she'll respond and I'll keep trying to remember to email her because after a while, you kind of get discouraged and just forget about emailing her. But she was going through tough times when COVID hit because her husband got COVID and he was in the hospital. We talked on the phone that one time. But uh, I have her colleagues that are friends of mine who are putting bugs in her ear about me and what we're doing here at myth vision to interview her. But I really, she is like, when she speaks, it's like this, this is good. This is really educated work. And, um, I really appreciate the super chat. So yeah, the yell open courses, we have courses too, Greg, that we're doing. We've got four out right now. I'm finishing editing Dennis McDonald's course, which is all about, Every bit of Dennis's work, mainly on mimesis, and uh, we structured it around this book. Then I have Kip Davis. Then I have two courses with Robin Faith Walsh. All of that is pinned in the chat. So go check out the website and sign up for a course. Be on the email list so that we have more stuff coming for you, and there'll be discounts for those who purchased course for future and past course and stuff that are coming. Anyway. Scrolling down. Constellation in the house again. Thank you so much for the support. Endless debates seems like the perfect words to describe this episode and Bible. It's perfect. So 
Constellation, I think you and me, I'm speaking to you. I think you'll understand, maybe appreciate my point of view here. Uh, maybe someone disagrees in the chat. That's fine. Let me know if you do. In fact, I'm going to say it and then type one if you agree or disagree. Two if you disagree. One if you agree. For me, the fact that this is so vague and open, I don't re I understand it's become a piece of art, but because we can't really get to the bottom of like, a lot of things that are meant here. And this is supposed to be a message to us about what God has to say. And when I see what I would call interruptions, when I said to, to John Collins, look at what God is saying in this text, because it says, thus saith the Lord. So God is speaking in this text on this paper. And he's saying some really nasty, nasty things about Israel and our sins and uses sexual violent language to do so, et cetera, et cetera. This is a God I don't believe in. And I think this is a man who's saying that God, he's writing saying, this is what God is saying. I, I think this is a product of man over and over and over. If God really wanted me to know something, then God himself or herself or itself would make sure that it, it was the one trying to tell me this. So the Bible is only like getting in the way of that. And this is why I tell Christians who go, you hold on, you've read your New Testament. And it tells you he rose from the dead and they saw him rose and they put their fingers in his side. And they, oh my God, and Paul says he was risen. If he wasn't risen, we're all stuck in our sins. And da, 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 da. how do you not read that and believe? And it's like, this is a book, an ancient book. Like, I don't trust that this is true. Just like I don't think Romulus ascended into heaven. I don't believe that uh, Asclepius was healing people and raising them from the dead. I don't believe that that's true. I don't think that actually happened. I don't believe it. And until I had some other revelation take place to convince me, then I don't think anybody reading an ancient book by men who are writing this material should literally believe this is true. That's my thoughts. And I hope that that message has come, come across clear. I do not want to disrespect people who believe this material. However, I am critical when people are using it as a weapon to go around saying, are you dumb? Have you not just read the words that are in the Bible? It's clear he rose from the dead. It tells you in the text when you're reading this text. Anyway, you get the point. I think you agree with me, Constellation. Let me know if you, if you do or don't. I'm scrolling down. I'm seeing if I've got people who are in support of what I'm trying to say here. Okay, um, 420 Junior Man says one. Oh, Constellation does agree with me on this. Okay, so we're on the same. You're picking up what I'm putting down here. John D., thank you, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, there's no evidence to think it's more than human. That's what I think as well. William Ahrens, thank you so much for that, uh, that one. Constellation, again, forgeries also. <laughs> one times 10. Uh, thank you so much. And... Um, Gollum, I'm hope I'm saying that right. Was one I agree? Farset says yes. So we have a one point. We have to have a contrarian in the house. A one point five, right? So I'm not doing math here, everybody. You're gonna trip me up here. It's been too long. <laughs> Constellation again is like I'm gonna repeat this. Um, Farset is two minus one, which is one. Thank you so much. Uh, you're, you guys are going to screw me up. You're going to catch my ignorance. Uh, I haven't done math since like serious, uh, since high school, honestly, like serious math. I did a little bit. We dabbled in it when we got into, in, when I was going to the Christian college, but it was like calculus, pre-calculus work at the end of my high school. And then from there, it was like, eh, I killed a lot of brain cells over the years after that as well. But I think it's more about like practicing when it comes to mathematics. Anyway, we're getting off track. Uh, Lynn says one. Someone's in the mood with that six to nine, and the, and then someone's in the mood with that four twenty. <laughs> Greg Royce now has watched you one year now. Love Myth Vision. Myth Vision is my first ever Patreon membership. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Bible is not monolithic. Agreed. Not one book. Agreed. I think Martin recognizes that, and that is. So let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater here. I did a course, edited the course for Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman did a course on Genesis. And he said, you want to know what the greatest discovery in the past few centuries is? I think past century or few centuries. He says, it's not the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
It's not Nag Hammadi. It's not this or that manuscript we discovered. It, he says it's recognizing and realizing the Bible is not one book. It is so many voices with so many different people who disagree, who contradict, who aren't on the same page, who are talking about different things, and their portrayals, their perceptions of the God. And if their perceptions of God are subjective based on their social, environmental, cultural, historical context, and then the next guy's perception of God is different, then why are we trusting this book? This is, I think Dr. Martin would agree with me and us in this, like, why are we trusting this guy to have the accurate perception, which is why he says the Bible alone, like, no, Christianity is all about interpretation and it's about how meaning is understood to them. Maybe they are reading some of the Bible, but they're not relying on it solely, which is why I think Protestants came in and went to, we need to get back to the book. We need to get back to the text. And then they ran into problems over the next two, three centuries and realizing, oh my God, there's problems with the text. There's real problems with this book. So I'm with you, Greg, and I think Martin recognizes that as well. So we have common ground. I just he admitted even in the interview, if you go back, he says, "Well, I go further, way further than John Collins, radical compared to some of these scholars who are doing different things." And maybe he's justified. Maybe I'm wrong. At the end of the day, Martin's right. I just personally can't. I just don't. I think he goes too far. My thoughts, but who knows? Seed, seed of Iblis. Thank you for the one and the hizzy. William with the one zero one zero one zero. You were afraid to say my name because I hate butchering names, man. Put me on the spot. Is it Gollin? Get. I, I'm, I'm gonna mess something up. Uh, Clive says they totally agree with me. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I've been out of practice with math for a long time. Scrolling down here, scrolling down here. So, um, did I miss anybody here? Anyway, all right. I didn't see anything specific. So there you have it. Uh, did I miss anybody? I hope I didn't. Greg, thank you for that. I hope everybody enjoyed it. I thought it was very educational. There's a lot of good stuff that was in this episode. At the end of the day, lower your confidence in thinking you know what the Bible says on so many points uh, for those who use it as a weapon and, um, and understand there are various ways to come at things and try to understand the nuance of text which makes it more complicated. Not so simple. Anywho, thank you so much, uh, everybody. I really uh, appreciate you. Hit the like button, share it again. Didn't I already mention we've got the courses and stuff? Let me pop that up here. I'm working hard. I just did a video with Richard Carrier. I'm working really hard. We did a course, I mean. Um, view all courses. And I put a lot of time and energy and I've got courses literally right now in the, the queue. Dennis is almost done with his mimesis. Kip Davis on ancient Israelite religions, almost done. That won't take me too long to edit. I have two courses with Robin Faith Walsh. I've got stuff coming up. So New Testament studies for everyone. we got this course out right now, early bird special, jump on it. And then eventually we'll do Q&A. The Mark course, if you haven't done that, I mean, all of these courses are really, really high quality. The Historical Jesus Quest. This one is not about making a case for Jesus historically. This is the history of scholarship from the Protestant Reformation. It literally dabbles into what we did today, even with this whole interpreting thing. Because he goes and shows you how Protestant scholars and exegetes throughout time we're starting to realize problems with the New Testament. They started going, this is mythology. Uh, talking about uh, David Friedrich Strauss. Like he interprets a lot of the New Testament as mythology, but it has meaning. It, it carries meaning, but it didn't literally happen. It did not happen historically. And then you have rationalists who came on the scene and were like, no, 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 no. Jesus walked on water because he was actually walking toward the shore. So it looked like he was on water. So the uh, person writing it made it sound like he was actually walking on water, but really he was just on the really sh the sand or the, the shore of that lake. So it looked like he was, the list goes on. But all of the historical people that play a role going down to E.P. Sanders, John Dominic Crossan, and then we have ancient Greek mystery cults. Uh, seven lectures here. The seventh lecture is about the language of Paul, where it's mysterious language, uh, mystery cult type language. And he kind of does a little bit of comparing 
but doesn't want you to try and act like early Christianity must have been a mystery cult. But uh, if he is going to these other people who are participants in other mystery religions, then he's going to he's gonna talk like them. He's probably going to use language similar to the cults he's trying to uh, get people out of to come to the Christ cult. We have the Patreon. And I think that was pretty much it. All right, back to you for a second here. Constellation never gives up, never. Evidently, we have text that continues before and after the flood without an interruption, proving the flood bogus, enough said. <laughs> There's a lot of ways to approach this issue and realize that we're talking about mythology or, as many Christians want to say, it's a localized flood. It's only in this region. There's problems with that as well. It never ends. It never ends. So... Everybody, man, thank you for being in the chat. Miss J, being a member and being in the chat. James Apperson, go subscribe, and he's a member. Thank you so much. Shout out to Constellation for keeping it locked down later, everyone. I really appreciate y'all. Okay, I'm getting out of here. I'm going to go get some food. I've, I've been having fun hanging out with you. I hope that you didn't mind me hanging out after the stream to discuss that with you a little further. And uh, to rabbit trail, goodness gracious, before I go to exit the door, someone drops a super. William Ahrens, thank you. <laughs> the important thing is not how timeless and unchanging the Bible could be, but rather could Bible be interpreted in a way that helps people today? I think it can, but it's like, do we need it? And this is the thing I, I disagreed with John Dominic Crossan on. He thinks we need this tradition because without tradition, we have nothing to stand on. I think we can create our own. If people were willing and able to write this book, and I would say it's man-made, then we could write our own structures. You have humanist societies. You have others who are rewriting their own myth, their own legends, their own story with up-to-date ethics. And I would even go so far as to say not only up-to-date ethics or better ethical uh, approaches, to, to the world around us, the way we saw yesterday, Jesus seems to, in these texts of the Gospels, engaging with the model of slavery as if it is normal and does not condemn it. Can we not write things that help better guide us and give us something motivating? We see movies with mythology that are legendary, that are, that are mythological in nature, that give us inspiration on how to behave, how to act. Why can't we do that? Do we need this to, to model our life after? Or can we not read this as artistic, uh, as, as history, as something to say, this was what we thought then, but here's now what we think today. That's my only thing. I understand Christians do this because this is what they do. They renegotiate with their contemporary ethics and, and situations, and we all do it. But I don't know if we need it. And that's the thing I'm trying to, well, I don't not know. I really don't think we need it. Um, and I'm trying to convey that with my own life, with somebody who made it out of addiction without needing God or Christianity, um, is, is living a life, you know, I'm a better person today than I ever was as a Christian. Um, so that's my only, my only point. And I don't want to go at people who are renegotiating the meaning of the text and are all against the bad ideas that we do talk about. We find that seems to be conveyed in this literature. I'm with the people who are ethically on the same page, even though they may believe, and I don't, it's the people who are actually trying to say the Bible doesn't do these things and are weaponizing it. You need to believe you're going to hell. If you don't believe this, you're going to go to hell or you get the point. They use it as a, as a, as a weapon. So anyway, that's my Ted talk. Thank you, William Ahrens. Love you. Thank you for always showing up in the chat. And William, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I know that you come from a tradition, a believing tradition, but you have shown such maturity. Uh, I think you're also a patron of mine. I've seen you around and that's something that I do think we want to do here at Myth Vision. We don't want to just smash any and everyone in the path of saying, we don't think these are true. You, you know, I don't, um, in the literal sense, like this really happened. Uh, you could find meaning in this stuff, but you know, I, I also do have an agenda to help get people out of fundamentalism. Come on, stop 
hitting people in the head with that book. But thank you, William. Appreciate your support and always uh, showing up. All right. Am I out of here? Myth Vision saved my soul, Greg said. <laughs> well, I do have the mystery. And anyone who's joined us, who supports us, likes the video, shares, you're all part of the body of Myth Vision. Hallelujah. Really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to do my little Matrix outro um, tomorrow. Let me, let me give you my calendar while we're at it. Tomorrow, Dr. Matthew Munger. I am actually doing a stream with him, and he was a missionary in Africa, and it went down. Wait till you hear what happened. We're talking about life and death. Uh, serious stuff happened, but he ended up um, you know, leaving Christianity and is a Bible scholar who knows too much. It says it in the description. Once that stream's over, we're going to funnel over to his channel to watch his first video. He started a YouTube channel. Stay tuned. That's tomorrow. My wonderful queen, queen, the queen of myth vision. It's her birthday on the 17th. St. Patrick's day is my wife's birthday. And I am going to be taking uh, those days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday off to spend time with her and the family. Next week, I have ex pastor, uh, current, um, uh, I think it's a life coach and porn star, Nicole Mitchell coming on next week. We're going to get down in some nitty gritty. Mm -hmm. It's going down next week. So stay tuned. That's Tuesday. I haven't set up the stream yet, but it will be set up. Karen De La Carriere is coming up again. Uh, she's an ex-Scientologist. She was at the top, married to the president of uh, the Scientology, Hubert Jensen, something like that. Um, James Crossley, his new book's coming up next Thursday on the 23rd. I have in person um, Matthew Hartke, who has done a lot of the stuff on apocalypticism. He's coming to my house on the 25th, and then I'm doing something with Jacob Berman on the 27th on his channel, and uh, we're doing also a live stream with Neil Dennis and um, – the starter of the Greek website, Neil knows, Gnostic Informant can tell you better than I can. In April, Dan McClellan, I'm having him back on. We're going to be doing that on the 7th. There's a preterism debate we're doing, full preterism versus someone who thinks Jesus failed on the 12th, which you've never seen that happen. Full preterists always usually debate other Christians within like different camps of eschatology. And then... Richard C. Miller, I'm making a trip down to California on the 28th through the 30th to the 1st um, to do in-person interviews with him. He wrote a book called Resurrection and Reception in Early Christianity. He thinks, and his whole book brings up the case, that the resurrection, the eyewitness testimony from 1 Corinthians, from the early church fathers in the Gospels is all legendary. Stay tuned. And this is a critical scholar. And then we have more courses coming up. With James D. Tabor, James, yeah, I thought I said D. James Tabor. I don't know why. We went a little dyslexic for a second there. In May, early May, we're recording. We're probably going to do two or three courses. One is Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls. The other is Who and What is the Life of the Apostle Paul, which um, he has written many books on. And then, of course, what was the last one he wrote me on this this morning? He said... Um, He said, so, all right, Paul, a Paul course and Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls and maybe apocalypticism through the ages and why prophecy fails. So he's going to get into that. It's like just over and over, there's a hundred percent track record that apocalypticism fails. We're going to get into that. Three courses. There you have it. All right. All right. In case I missed you, scrolling up, making sure I didn't leave nobody hanging. Everybody. Good. We're good. Okay. There you have it. Be on the lookout. Love you. I'm going to go eat. Never forget. We are Myth Vision. Son, do you want to know what the truth is? After this, there's no turning back. You take the blue pill and you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to. You take the red pill and you stay in Wonderland. And I show you just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more.